Yo. Go to the game screen with them so I can write down the names. Ah, okay. Alright. Uh, Arista Lee is a she, her. Min Min is a she, her. Oh, my God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jeez. And are they in, uh, they're in order?
and welcome Overwatch fans. We are here live with the EGFC, that is the Electronic Gaming Federation collegiate side. I'm FBI Tugboat, joined with me here today for EGF's first, not our first by any means, is Beatdown Boulevard, and we got my man Juke out there producing away, making our jobs as casters just so much easier. Beat, how are we doing, my man? Dude, I'm feeling so great right now. It's been a hot minute since you and I have been on the mic together. I know we've been pushing for it for some amount, an ungodly amount of time now, but now we're back here casting some collegiate, collegiate Overwatch. It's going to be Niagara versus St. Peter's, and I, for one, am so here for it. Yes, sir. We're going to show you the, the schedule here, and then I'll run through some of the tales of all the things that Beatdown and I have tried to coordinate to cast up until True. this. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I won't bore you with, with the tale, but there literally has been like these otherworldly forces coming together. That's not what we're talking about here today. Monmouth, Ni Monmouth University, Siena, that was 430. That's in the past. Niagara University, St. Peter's University, that's where we're going to be seeing here today, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard. University of Delaware versus RIT up next. That will be a couple different casters, and Beat's going to take you through the rest. Yeah, that's right. And then later on at 9 p.m. Eastern, it's going to be UConn versus St. John's University. Canisius, I want to say. God, I'm sorry. Canisius. I'm Canadian. Versus no, it's cool. it's cool. Versus Fairfield <laughs> University. And that's going to be all your games for the night. So unfortunately, Tug and I aren't covering all of them, but we got some great casters waiting in the wings. Absolutely. Yes, Canisius. I realized what I did to you there, B, towards the end. If it makes you feel any better, literally everybody does that. Okay, um, that's good. We've gotten we've gotten multiple people from Canisius letting us know, and then um, uh, what is yeah, the other one? Sure. What is the other one, Juke? There's one more that that uh, Xavier, not uh, uh, Xavier, not Xavier, because we're all of course. Uh, 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 oh man, what is it? X Men, yes, X Men fans. There you go. <laughs> we're all X Men fans, right? Not Xavier like the professor, but Xavier with a Z. But uh, and there was another one, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Format wise, beat. We got this first two, three, not technically the best of five. It is to be the first two, three points. If there is a tie outside of our control maps, because that's not possible there, mm -hmm. then both teams will get no points, and they'll be going on to the next round. First two, three beat. Yeah, that's right. So it is going to be basically, so there is no tiebreaker, which is a, a very interesting way for them to run things out. Uh, Tug, but remind me, what maps are we going to be on? I'm pretty sure you said Havana was one of them, and I remember <laughs> just gagging a little bit because I don't I don't like that map. That That's entirely fair, Beat. Mm -hmm. We got, of these five, Busan, Blizzard World, Hanamura, Havana, and then Nepal. Yes, Hanamura, Havana, and yeah, they sound a little bit similar. Not, uh, not very similar in look by any means, but yes, Busan up first, little control action to start this one off. Now, the Busan is definitely a fun map to start things off on. I'm really curious to see what both these teams are actually going to bring out for us in terms of strategy. And now we're swapping over to the end game here. As soon as this wonderful transition is done, and there it is. So it is going to be Niagara University in the blue, St. Peter's in the red. As we're going to see what kind of compositions these guys want to bring out. Of course, it's almost taboo sacrilege if you will <laughs> to talk about teams and what their compositions are coming before they actually walk out of the spawn room but i'm already mm. seeing some differences here yeah uh reaper is super good position <laughs> our producer just wanting to see what he can do right here see if he can make it all the way through oh that was off center juke you lose <laughs> Niagara University, St. <laughs> Peter's. The the Reaper makes a whole whole lot of sense. Um, what uh, the Sombra is the obvious the obvious counter to that, but the tank lineup could not be more different. Yeah, that's exactly right. So if you're looking at St. Peter's University comp, especially Ricardo is going to have to try and basically go for potential flanks and make the space or sorry make use of the space his tank line is going to actually buy for him. You can see juicer, juicering with the early bubble before. They set up and try to go for a dive. Yeah, this is dive heavy over here, St. Peter's, especially with that Zenyatta, get a lot of damage in alternate ways. Up front, we got a McCree with a new health pool as well. Velvet Demise falling first on this, actually. So Niagara uh, has been down a huge source of damage, or a huge source of healing, and now big main tank down. Niagara took it earlier, but I don't think that is to last. Yeah, it's looking real good for St. Peter's overall. They lose first cap, but they have control of the point here. Nacho's having a real good time, as you can see. The man just be popping off a little bit. But overall, St. Peter's University, although not necessarily playing their tank line like you would expect from dive tanks like in the Winston and Diva, they were just taking up the time of Nag University while Ricardo got off so much damage from 
a side flank. So as long as they keep doing that and keep control of the space here, Ricardo's going to be able to do whatever he pleases. A stun against Apex, not a great way to start this one now. Now trying to make it 12 o'clock. That corner is not going to do him any favors. Large part just used for a little bit of zoning, it seems, as that's now Nachos who does fall. Red Bird gets incredibly aggressive there, finds a little bit of value, but the res now for Nachos puts St. Peter's back to a full six. Dive in, Juice Ring might just be pr trying to provide a little bit of split of attention here, but all through the thick of things, Apex turns and Apex falls. The damage boosted Reaper is a nasty one indeed as Ricardo taking out not one, not two, but three. Cheese is the only Niagara University player left on this field. Yeah, and you can see now the problem with Niagara University not running the McCree themselves. There's no flashbang, so no concern for Ricardo. He can literally just walk into the back line, and the only CC he's really got to worry about is that Reinhardt charge. Beyond that, he has freeze bird to do all the damage he pleases into Niagara University's front line. And now... You can see Niagara University are coming up on some pretty big ultimates as soon as that Graviton Surge is ready to go. You gotta imagine that's when they make their move. Yeah, we saw Bread Bread there just kind of holding the hand. Oh, what a oh. burst! Sellout squad oh looking God. like a DPS in and of himself. Rez getting in through the thick of things. Does have that self-destruct. Not sure that's going to be useful through a bubble. And again, Ricardo actually getting taken out by Bread Bread, but there was some Zenyatta damage in there. Absolutely. Sellout squad just been popping off here, and that's going to lead to St. Peter's holding on to this one. Yeah, and unfortunately, they got a lot of ults out of St. Peter's, but time is running out. I don't think anyone from Niagara is going to be able to contest. You see Cheese make the Genji swap, but it's not too late. It looks like we do get the last second contest, but Red Bird's already dead. Yeah, both support ultimates on board for St. Peter's with the main support done from Niagara University. It means this should be a very quick team fight. Just everybody that plays their roles, gets it done. Primal Rage there at the end, here for Juice Ring. There's nobody going to be around to give him that thousand damage. This one going uh, decently handily towards St. Peter's. It looked like they just kept it cool, and when they needed to, got it done. Held on to ults and all. Yeah, that's right. They were super efficient with how they used them as well, with the exception of the High Noon, as Ricardo's going to get that one up, or Nachos, excuse me. He's going to get that one up pretty often, but overall, St. Peter's, making good use of this these dive tanks to the point where they're the only ones who actually sit on the point you have sell squad on an angle throwing those fat right clicks and of course you have nachos and ricardo going for different angles as well there's so many points of pressure on niagara university that reinhardt shield didn't actually mean what it normally would so this time around they're going for a bit of a switch up we're seeing apex play the sigma i'm really curious to see if dc 224 actually stays on this diva and it's looking like hmm. that is going to be the play here so an interesting tank line for sure it's going to serve a similar purpose to the reinhardt of sigma is also extremely immobile but i'm curious to see how they play around this one cheese is still the one to look out for here especially against wow. nachos but you can't get Man. solo killed like that no, you can't. So what, McCree gets himself an extra 25 healing oh and he is just absolutely neglected here in game number two, right? Like, no, I thought Nacho was doing a very, very fine job on the McCree and now Cheese goes on over to it. Yeah, stars out with the Ash, there's the McCree. Yeah, and overall, it's just an easy first fight win here for St. Peter's. Nacho making use of this open space and the confidence he's gained from that last round. Because you can see Cheese not having the best performance at the moment has swapped it over to McCree. I like this because now you can threaten Ricardo with that flashbang a little bit. And it's going to make it harder for him to just step into the back line all willy-nilly. But I still want to see Niagara University try and make some aggressive plays. DC, I want to see him harass Nachos because Echo shouldn't be free firing like that. This is Cheese just trying to kind of play the position here where they're at. There's so much damage coming through there. It's just going to be super hard for any sort of shield, much less a Sigma shield to block them off with things coming through there. Yeah, so Sigma shield comes up, Sigma shield goes down within seconds. And now, actually, we have Nachos getting it going here already early. Coalescence as well as Gravitic Flux happening on the side. That is Nachos who did decide to copy. May I pick 75% to his? We'll see his here soon. Cheese able to get out of the line of fire on this one. Back towards damage, but oh my. Even the efforts of an Arista Lee Moira, that was, there was just way too much jamming coming across him. And this team fight's still not over with, really. St. Peter's looks like they've won it. Now pulling ultimate again. Juice Ring has hmm. now gotten two primal rages that they just didn't. I mean, last turn it was. Or last game, it was uh, very, very end, right? That's right. So this time around, though, I, I think could have held on to that one. The fight was more 
Then clearly one in St. Peter's University, and now that's one less crucial ultimate not available here. Look at Niagara University. They're starting to get a little bit onto the better end of these fights, and with the ultimates they have ready to go, now they have their own Gravitic Flux. You see the Death Blossom High, or uh, the Dead Eye, excuse me. And uh, there's a lot of tools to work with here, but it's last fight territory. It's now or never. Yeah, the rest of Niagara is close, but only Apex Red Bread and Cheese has it so far. Here goes the Death Blossom, Gravitic Flux, while things are going on, pulling the Zenyatta out of the thick of things for right now, but that's going to be a different Death Blossom down bottom that finds all the results in the world. Nacho is actually copying, yeah, copying that Reaper as well, and St. Peter's University going to put a bow on top of this one. And what's better than one Death Blossom? St. Peter's University say two, as they're also going to very handedly win the first map of the set 2-0. Oh, looking absolutely dominating right now. And more than anything else, as much as Ricardo gets to play the game, of course, we saw a lot of work coming out from Notches as well. Juicering and Rez are the ones I want to highlight here. They played their role so extremely well. Rez on this wow. D.Va, harassing the hitscan members of Niagara University, not actually letting them do anything, was really impressive. Yeah, so we, we see the uh, the play of the game there, triple by that uh, by that Reaper. Actually, as Apex kind of gets on out of uh, gets on out of dodge, so that one set that one up. Big triple, but 100 to 15, I believe, for the game number one, and then 100 to zero for game number two. We'll be looking at Blizzard World next, a uh, handedly different map. Yeah, a little bit. I I think we're still going to run into the same issues because it's not really by map type. At the end of the day, what I'm seeing St. Peter's do a lot more than Niagara is controlling space. And that's the nice thing about those dive tanks. They're super mobile. They're able to control space with their very presence, the threat that they can offer onto the enemy backline. Niagara don't seem to have an answer. And not only that, they're not really punishing either. So St. Peter's are at this point where they can actually overextend a little bit, do a little more than they should because if Niagara are going to let them do it, keep it going so niagara at this mm. point either might want to consider consider mirroring and try to make space of their own with dive tanks and threaten st peter's back line or at the very least they need to start punishing because i don't rate, hate the reinhardt in these scenarios but you need to charge a little bit more i know people say unbind the shift key sometimes with really aggressive <laughs> reinhardt but this is the opposite i need you to press shift sometimes there you go. Yeah, <clears throat> charge right in there. Try and take a pick. You'll have Please. your teammates on after you. Yeah. I, I, as far as dive tanks, man, movement abilities will give you so much, uh, so much value in these. Running the Zarya Reinhardt, uh, there's a classic combination there. A lot of synergy, but I just mm -hmm. think it's it, it can easily kind of saw this be trounced by some really good coordination from your dive tanks. Mm -hmm. But uh, anything else we should look for as we're pushing on in here to Blizzard World. I mean, mostly it is going to be compositionally. Yeah, you do have a good point, Tug. So I think overall what's going to benefit Niagara greatly is that tank line switch up. Zarya Ryan, I guess not as good as it used to be, especially me being a bit of a boomer. It's been a outside, <laughs> if we're not counting goats, because that was a little different. I think it's been a long time since just that comp or that tank line was exceptionally, mm. was just exceptional and played all the time. So maybe, yeah, we do need a bit of a switch up. Maybe the Winston Diva. Maybe Sigma. They, we did see a little bit, but I don't think Sigma Diva is the way necessarily. Well, they kind of use the Sigma in a way that Reinhardt would have been best, right? They got bottled yeah. up by this chokehold there on Busan Nap too. Come through and then try. I mean, even through the e, you know Sigma's Eat and Sigma Shield, there was not a whole lot that they could do through there because so much damage was coming across, right? Well, the the, yeah. the changes for his shield all the way down to where it was it are appropriate, but just those aren't Sigma responsibilities. Those are times to be running the Reinhardt. I feel like, like you yeah. said, really, there was just uh, issues of synergy coming kind of up until that for Niagara, and if they'd chosen then to run. Reinhardt would have been a different story. They would have gotten a point. Who knows? Maybe. We'll see what's going on in Blizzard World. Yeah, that's right. It's definitely not over yet by any means. Control is always has always been considered a bit of a different beast compared to other map sites in Overwatch. So as we go over to Blizzard World, more of a hybrid, there is going to be a more of a chance, more opportunities for defense specifically, and even on offense is trying to take sites here for the likes of Niagara. So I wouldn't count them out just yet. Well, absolutely not. Now, the Ash here might be huge, especially for first point. On defense, that high ground right there provides you a lot. They've ran a mercy already. Both squads have for at least a little while. And two image boosting on top of that, I mean, absolutely massive for your Ash headshots. That sets up, of course, uh, Squishies to fall left and right. Now, with Widowmaker at 175, might... Uh, might, might really be able to counter out something like that either. Blizzard World, little capture a point, little uh, move a payload. 
Yeah, that's right. And, and now that you mentioned it to the Mercy play, I, I especially would want to see if we're, let's talk about St. Peter's a little bit. I want to see them play that Echo again. I really like what we saw from, I believe it was Nachos who ran it the first time around. And I saw a really good performance, especially once we move over to the streets phase here. I think you could do a lot of work with that. But one thing I'm really interested in, Niagara, they have Fred Beard on the Junkrat here. And since he is all the way at eight point, I'm pretty confident that's what Niagara is sticking with here. Yep, and I just now realized, I, I have looked at this player's name, the Junkrat Niagara, several several different times through the weeks now. I, I wrote it down as Bread Bread again, just like Bread <laughs> twice. I said oh, Bread well. Bread today, actually, but it is yep. Bread Beard, it looks like. Uh, he probably knows what he's doing, kind of thing, there. So, yes, actually, Niagara defense called it. Love to see it. Rissaly on her mercy. That is cheesed over on the ash. A lot of damage will be coming out from True. Bread Beard. And yes. uh, the D will be eating it all up. Apex will be blocking away as much damage as possible on the Reinhardt. Everybody getting group heals from the Moira. Not against it at all. And Juice Ring on this Zarya is going to be very interesting. A lot of potential for to get that high energy and put out that high damage as well. You can already see the energy mm -hmm. starting to build up here, but he's gonna have to build it up efficiently. And as all the damage coming through from Niagara, the use of the protective barrier is super important. Ricardo is already taken down though. Res there, that's gonna mean Min Min does not have that res for the next, what, 35 seconds or so. Cheese falling through the thick of things. That's gonna be their big source of damage. And now Res getting those Ryan responsibilities and swinging away. And that's gonna be Apex who falls. St. Peter's rolling through here. Niagara had a great start. Not so much about the finish. Yeah, unfortunately, the loss of Aristalia spent, spelt the end for Niagara's A-point defense. St. Peter's still, once again, firmly in control here. You can see Juicering is getting real juiced up as well on the Zarya. So now as we move over to the streets phase, Niagara University aren't going to change things up. Redbeard getting closer and closer to that rip tire is part of that motivation, I am sure. And it would actually be one well-placed rip tire could give Niagara control back onto the site here. They could mount a defense here on the streets. I like what Redbeard is doing up top here as well, putting out traps and laying down damage, make Ooh. sure. Oh man, Nachos with the Min Min damage boost. Taking out one, that's gonna eat up the res again. This is exactly what St. Peter's did last time. See how it fares for them this time. Res trying to rotate around here. It looks like Niagara trying to come back towards the middle of this payload path. And again, Apex just gets way too aggressive with here. Can't be held out. Uh, and yeah, and DC isn't over there with the defense matrix. Yeah. Oh. So. And unfortunately, the spoken of Riptire doesn't find any value at all as Ricardo swapped over to the Hanzo. Has just been doing so much work finding a lot of key shots here. So much so he already has the Dragon Strike ready to go. And all it's going to take is one more fight for St. Peter's to cap, uh, win out here on the streets. Phase have an excellent time back. Niagara, they have ults to use, especially that Earth Shatter coming up. I need to see him use mm. it. Oh my nice God. shot there by Ricardo to start this one out. Oh. The Shatter comes down as soon as the Nano's out. Apex getting taken out by that one. That's going to be a worthwhile charge in all day long. Contest still coming through. Now the Valkyrie up top, not going to matter. St. Peter's taking this point, getting up their time bank to two and a half minutes almost, beat. And the unfortunate part of it is Niagara University, they committed a lot to that bike tug, and unfortunately, it didn't even get them a single inch or buy them another second. St. Peter's, five minutes, ten seconds going into the final point here. This is where you lose a lot of time, but still, Niagara have a lot of work to do if they want to whittle that time bank all the way down here. They've kind of played this split defense as well, and with the D.Va going down first several different times, this might be different, though. It's Bob out, but just absolutely sworn by the Reinhardt and that opposing counterpart, that Ash. Over here, looks like Rez is going to be really close on that shield. Not a whole lot left on that, but Shatter will be up soon. Investing ults might not be the movement here. Yeah, this is just going to be kind of some stall out on point. Niagara University needs to come back. Hey, you can see positioning is a bit of a problem here. You noticed on the Juice Ring's POV that he was single-handedly soloing those supports and keeping them off the front line, and frankly, the rest of Niagara University. And because mm. of these positioning errors, oh, unfortunately, Aristalia might lose her life here. Instead, it is going to be Cheese. Nope, it's going to be both. Oh, and overall, man. this self-destruct is going to have to go big, Tug. So Cheese tries to come in, pull the rescue mission. Doesn't happen there towards the end. End up losing a support and a big source mm -hmm. of damage. Now the switches from Niagara. Blessed on over the Soldier 76, trying to get out of here quickly. 
Oh, Redbeard immediately gets obliterated here, and unfortunately, Niagara not able to shave much time off the clock here. We're in the closing seconds of this round, and DC is the only one who can contest, but no one else was actually able to get on. So there you have it. Wow, they end this one as well with uh, what Nano Boost and uh, Graviton Surge for St. Peter's. Yeah, pretty, pretty handed win again. Start with four minutes, end with 345. That's pretty darn good, Beat. Yeah, that it is. And we're going to see and just a replay here of Juice Ring and Ricardo. Really the one I want to highlight here. The reason Niagara University didn't mm. have to use so many of their ultimates, and especially towards the end, be able to stack them for the finish is because Ricardo, he ends up getting so many key picks. Every time DC especially is out of the mech there on D.Va, just gets blown up. Ricardo finds the two body shots, occasionally finds the headshot, and always being able to take them out of the game is honestly really huge in this composition where you need both of your tanks to try and give you space to try and even threaten that back line. Gonna be a huge part of it. What? So I think that I was kind of like watching a replay there, right? Apex gets up, gets up and aggressive. And I think that if St. Peter's running darn near any other supports or any other DPS at that distance, he probably would have gotten back. But as it is, just all the damage in the world, all the focus, two medium range uh, snipers there, the Hanzo, the Ash, just gonna make short work of even on that one looking at st peter's in the defense uh yeah pretty different from what we saw from niagara's defense right <laughs> true especially one of course naturally wants to highlight the torbjorn honestly pretty solid pick on this map there are a lot of really good positions that nachos can place the turret and of course a lot of poke that he can dish out not quite the same as junkrat but with min min applying that damage boost onto him and ricardo a lot of damage can be done yeah niagara does not want to let anybody get damaged on from top of this platform here. Makes a lot of sense, uh, especially given they just, I mean, they know the value of this, right? They, they, they did a lot earlier. Apex, oh no, biting off more than he can chew on this one as we got the shoddy Torbjorn just going off here. Yeah, uh, he, okay, the last like three shots have been, have been the longer range ones, but he just pulled out the shotgun on that, what, three or four shots in a row, just gonna end most of Niagara University. Yeah, that's right, and it's going to end their offense as well. As you can see, St. Peter's have pushed up quite a bit at this point, just trying to p offer a lot of poke with that Soldier 76. And Niagara seems like they're not really sure what to do. We've seen a swap come through. Cheese is back on this Genji, and it's going to be really tough for him to find value into St. Peter's composition. As soon as you dive in there, you're going to get blown up. That's why you need Apex and DC to buy you as much space as you can. But in that time frame, Cheese needs to get a kill. If not, okay. they're all just going to get blown up. Maybe this is the opposite of good, right? It seems like Niagara is almost needing to start pushes from this platform up here. As mm -hmm. it is, like you were saying, St. Peter's has so much poke. Now the dive comes in. Now fo shifting focus from the rest of the supports and DPS up top for Niagara. Apex gets out of time, or gets out in time. That's Breadbeard getting everything done there. Rez finish, and this is the best shot Niagara's had so far. Just like that, St. Peter's out here killing dreams. And the Molten Core, such a powerful ultimate here. Aristalia is actually trying her best to keep the things alive here on this offense. But unfortunately, I think that Coalescence was best saved for the next fight. You got a lot out of St. Peter's as a result. Tactifies Molten Core, even the Valkyrie. So you could have gone into that fight with the Coalescence. The fact that Vel Velvet also has a sound barrier. It's still a potential avenue here for Niagara to make things happen. As soon as Cheese gets that uh, Dragon Blade, Yo, well, that's when I expected sound bear, but they're committing it right now. Wow, okay, so a uh, little bit early. Yeah, I gotta point this out, right? Velvet Demise drops this. As soon as Rez's Shatter lands over here, literally there's Ditzels left. There, there, there's individual pixels of blue shield left on individual members of Niagara. I'm not trying to be too uh, critical here, but that was a mistime both all day. I completely agree with you there. If you if Velvet uses that just maybe two to three seconds yep. later, they would get a lot more value out of that decaying shields because well, simply it decays. So you need to get every second out of it that you can. Very, very Unfortunately, good, yeah. Dragon Blade yeah. doesn't find anything either. All they really have to work with here is Breadbeard's ultimate and potentially that Primal Rage as well in the next few seconds here. One minute left on the clock. St. Peter's look like they have this in the bag. I think Niagara only mm. has one good fight left. And, oh, they lost cheese. Already, the Vortex Rocket's coming out there, getting some really long range damage. And then Breadbeard does what he can. 45 seconds, I would say Niagara just backs up. Use the Lucio Speed Boost yeah. to get out of dodge while the getting is good. 
Oh no, but the Graviton Surge has been committed. They can't even walk it out. Tug and Juicering. Even though not as juiced up as Zarya can be, dishes out enough damage to take DC out of the mech. This is big. Talk about tracking there, knowing what targets you need to go after. DC on the Diva can block out all mates. Any other damage, excuse me, with that uh, with that defense matrix. And do it with lasers. Juice ring. Rest of St. Peter's doing a very good job. Three ultimates on board, close to Nano Boost. Niagara will be back in the soon. Yeah, that's right. With nine seconds left, a couple of ultimates to play with. Maybe they have a shot, but Apex is the one who needs to get onto the point first. But with three seconds, he is going to get there just in time. So overtime is coming through. But can the rest of the team get there? Can he survive? Earth Shatter comes through. Solo Shatter self destruct over the top. DC now back with his. Now that is a much good better game. sound barrier. Much that's better. Ricardo. Coming through, getting one. No more turret turret for this one is the coalesce, or not the coalesce, it's the torpedo and mobile core finding some. Dude, Redbeard dude. coming up. Yes, that's, that's three. three now, and that is all you need. All you need in this life of sin is a good blossom. <laughs> that's right, Tug. A Dagger University managed to get it done. Despite all the stalling Min Min is trying to pull, it is not going to suffice. Nagger University, from the brink of defeat, managed to keep themselves in this just a little bit longer. And the best part is mm, they're going to get a pick on cheese, Ricardo, as well. And I agree, not the smartest of decisions. I think Nagger University, especially in those last few minutes, are or uh, St. Peter's rather, are getting a little overconfident with how they're playing things. And the fact that they don't have alts right now could work really well in Niagara's favor. Cheese does have a Dragon Blade. You have Apex, who's now on the Wrecking Ball, who can buy you a lot more space as long as all that CC land. So I want to see them make a play once he respawns, hey. but instead he swapped to Arissa. Oh my god. I, I was I was amazed if Apex stays on the ball, right? Like, that that was literally just a, hey, we need to get up there and touch. Mm -hmm. It works, and that's awesome. This literally might be what Niagara Universe needs right now to kind of rattle St. Peter's. Coming back, mm -hmm. though, Arissa's now with the Fortify, not going to take too, too much for the time being. Res using that one, the Shatter down, oh. no shields to block that out, and that's going to be, yep. Uh, well, actually, so another ultimate kind of invested there, so they win the team fight, use Nacho's Molten Core. Yeah, but Cheese tried to salvage that play with the Dragon Blade as well, which is not ideal. With such a small time bank, a minute, 30 seconds left, just about. Nagger need all that they can muster, especially with big ults like the Earth Shatter and Molten Core down. St. Peter's, they still got things to work with though, and Brad, Brad, oh, mm. loses his life a little forward. Yeah, just a, a little bit of coordination sets that difference from Red Red coming in, loot falling out, and getting alive and getting a lot of value from it. A lot up top here, Ar Arista Lee getting everything done. Now the sound barrier coming through, no push afterwards though, unfortunately. Redbeard still on the side, being annoying. That's exactly what this Reaper needs to do. The facing down the barrel of a grab, Ricardo's aimbot, that attack visor. The Red is almost getting taken out for his aggression on this one. Now forced to come back. This is St. Peter's University. He knows what to do. Oh, oh. man. The stun coming out from, yeah, the Shatter actually. So, yeah, I mean, trades, a, trades an ultimate for an ultimate. I can guarantee you that Red Red's going to get that Death Blossom faster than the Shatter, though. Yeah, without a doubt, it's tough though. Juice Ring is oh, rest, no. still has the Graviton Surge. DC needs to eat this one, Tug. It's their last chance here for an Agri University. Big pick against Ricardo. Huge source of damage as well as Nacho's Torb turret on this one. Coming back, St. Peter's looking decently cool, calm, and collected. Supercharger done. Everybody's on point, so that's decent so far. Red Reard falls to the purple again. No Reaper Shadow Step this to take that out now that's the grab might be it coalescence out but that's not gonna be enough to face against the onslaught of st peter's university's dps core full team kill no we're not gonna get the bell but basically out there niagara university with a solid little solid little second game second half uh push on yeah. this one but ultimately for naught the unfortunate St. Peter's are with another victory going to put themselves at match point here in this first to three. It feels like they just have Niagara University's number. They have matched them at every turn and done even better, especially with Nachos on this Torbjorn pick. I don't think you see it as often anymore, but on defense, it's still quite the powerhouse pick. And this is exactly why. And now as we're going to map three, I got to wonder what it's going to take for Niagara University to actually bring this thing back. Yeah, it's uh, you know, rock and a hard place situation for Niagara. Uh, map one on the Busan was a little bit different. Blizzard World was uh, 
what, what was very like straight inspirational there towards the end. The picks that they would get on individual like roles, individual tanks, DPS, and supports were setting up these team fights that they could have easily won, uh, ju- mm-hmm. you know, just as easily won than lost. And then it started changing, right? Like the momentum started changing. They started winning more. They started pushing payload. But really, it just came down to time there at the end. Last game for <laughs> Niagara University, St. Peter's University, going to be starting here in just a couple minutes. We're going to give these teams a little bit of time to figure out what they want to do, what they want to recreate. And we'll be back with you guys in just a minute.
And we are back. I told you it wouldn't be super, super long. FBI Tugboat here, mm -hmm. joined the man Beatdown Boulevard. Juke over there, producing away, making our jobs as casters just so much easier, and we do appreciate that. Let's talk a little bit about these two teams, but first, give me the scores from maps one and two, Beat. Well, we're going to start things off with the fact that St. Peter's, one map, one boost on so convincingly, 2-0, and if you're just joining us, and of course, map two, wasn't a uh, much better three to one on Blizzard World once again for St. Peter's, who are now at match point and feel like they've just been in complete control the entire time here. And it feels like we've seen some some flashes of brilliance here from Niagara, some some opportunities for them to actually contend. But in those big moments, it ends up falling just a little bit short, mostly due to a bit of alt mismanagement and sometimes some compositional errors. And that's, as we go into that's, map three, yeah, hopefully they can. Uh, Hopefully they can change things up a little bit here on this potentially final map, because this is their last chance. You know, first to three, St. Peter's takes this. It will be over with now. That's right. I'm trying to think. I mean, the, yes, there was a there was a velvet sound barrier that was kind of mistimed. Yeah. Compositionally wise, you know, that's fair. Uh, Niagara University seems like they kind of got it together, but I think the only thing really standing between Niagara University and St. Peter's University being a very even matchup is Niagara just kind of cleaning up those edges a little bit, right? Coordination, mm -hmm. communication, old management, old track, and things like this. Yeah, uh, I think that's exactly right, Tug. So as we go into the last map here, it's not quite over yet. Hanamura definitely could get off to a good start with a solid double cap here. And since St. Peter's are on the offense, Niagara University could actually start off with a pretty solid defense here as they're starting off on point A. I like it. Redbeard is going for that Symmetra pick, but I like it even more. Nachos is back on this Echo, which we saw so much good work from before. Yeah, uh, what? If you don't uh, don't have time to make a mirror mirror composition with your opponents, just, you know, just pick up an Echo. You'll get halfway there, right? <laughs> Big purple. <laughs> DC falling and now getting super aggressive against Cheese. Only has that deflect, not going to do anything against your beam type focuses. Breadbeard finding a couple on this one, swapping around Crucial. momentum, but that was huge against Velvet. Not able to get out on that one. Min Min now getting over to her support. No, to her DPS, excuse me. And uh, for the, right now, at least, getting out of the way of damage, right? It's going to be tough, though. Niagara University's team aren't going to be here for just a little bit longer here. So St. Peter's do want to use their spawn advantage to push up. Ricardo's been res. Here they go. There you go. Full six on six, but not for long. Res, Ricardo, Cheese, both down. Sell it squad as well. So big source of healing out the side of St. Peter's University. Now G-String as well. And this is Niagara University squad that is playing, God, like, just completely different. Night and day different. And there it is. And I think Redbeard, very comfortable. Confident and comfortable, clearly on the Symmetra, finding a lot of crucial picks, keeping Niagara in the game for quite a bit of time. They've already shaved almost half the time bank off here. So Redbeard needs to keep doing what he's doing. And now you can see Niagara still have some ults to work with. St. Peter's are looking pretty good as well. I'm very curious to see Nachos copies. Oh, they want a wall of their own, but the shatter! Nachos comes down, Nachos goes out very quickly. Echo Ultimate wasted on that one after some really good coordination, but that's not gonna matter. Recorder getting up close and personal. Shatter lands, and that is a huge hole. Or, uh, high noon, excuse me. The attempted Genji ult in front of him, not gonna happen. If Cheese had that deflect, we'd just be looking at a different game right now, Maybe. but as a theory crafting at its worst, I suppose, at this point. <laughs> That's true. I think the problem, too, is the Apex getting caught out there. When Niagara still had a very clear advantage, he might have gotten charged by Rez. If so, props to him. But either way, that's going to be a pretty decently fast first cap for St. Peter's. Niagara definitely made him work for it, though. And now as we move over to this site, you can see Nachos is just poking away, trying to avoid all the damage that he can. But oh my god, mm. can't avoid cheese. Nah, Min Min now getting that resin, starting that resurrection cooldown. Now hanging out outside, very smart for a Mercy to do. Still getting the healing and the damage in, not able to be hit on the other side. Dynamite up, dynamite out, dynamite not gonna find anything quite so far. Now St. Peter's trying to roll in from the up top here. A different, uh, yeah, what, a two-fronted war, you could say, from the side of St. Peter's as Ricardo finding a nice headshot against a huge source of damage, and now the 
grab out lots in there. Dynamite's gonna find one against St. Peter's, but that is their only loss so far. Oh my goodness, excuse me. Nacho's deleted as well. This one's not totally finished. Arista Lee still there with the Symmetra wall out. That'll provide them a little bit, but nothing against the melee swings of your Rez Reinhardt. Still contesting this one out. Niagara Universe is going to be back whole handedly soon. Not one, but two Zarya bubbles blocks out the vast majority of that Zarya, or that uh, Shatter, excuse me, High Noon over here, but they have their Reinhardt back now. Some nice roll and tumble. Get six shots out of the cylinders there, and now that's going to be up to about 60%. At least second one. I think we'll probably need to see a ball if they want to get out to this. Not going to matter. Velvet Demise cannot touch. Yeah, and there it is. As soon as they cap, as fast as they cap the first point, they do cap second. Three minutes is definitely a solid time bank to be happy about. Niagara University, again, really close on a lot of these fights. But what ends up happening is that Symmetra, or sorry, the Symmetra ult isn't quite as good as that high noon in this scenario. But we're going to look at this replay. Ricardo gets a huge play with that uh, Earth Shatter assisted Deadeye there. And you talked about it too, how. The, the Dragon Blade could have made the difference there, but unfortunately, Cheese didn't have the deflect. It looks like he was, can... like, starting he... the ultimate, right? Yeah. Like, uh, like, in that animation, yeah, so it exactly. can't deflect. Yeah, so what, the difference of a quarter of a second, man? Like, Maybe. a half a second? Could have been a different play, like you said. Mm. But, fortunately, it's an alternate time nine for another <laughs> time, I suppose, as Niagara University now have to come back on this offense here, and they are hovering... Redbeard on that far. I gotta say, I'm a big fan personally, uh, but I like say I like what St. Peter's is bringing out a little bit more. I like this May on the defense. I like uh, the potential of walling off the choke there, and it's honestly a really common strat here on Hanamura, especially because Niagara aren't gonna know right away. And that first pick is already gonna buy them so much time. So if somehow Niagara can actually avoid that first May while play around it, they have a decent shot at capturing the first point. I like the May. Uh, May point one Hanamura classic pick. Oh Especially yeah. If, you, if you're willing to like dedicate everything into it, like basically like crawl to point without breathing, not making any yes. noise, well it off and then switch. So it's like they're operating off a different game plan. But that's that that is a big investment in of itself, especially for point one. Fifteen seconds yeah. in, Niagara University trying to find a way in edgewise. Nothing so far. As Arisalis falls, that's the majority of their healing. Niagara just needs to come back here, especially with no shield tank, no yeah, real shield tank. They have a bubble. Excuse me. And this time it's Nachos, the one flexing the Hanzo here, doing so much work for St. Peter's. And look at that, they're pushing up and they're just finding more and more damage here onto Niagara University. They got it back all the way up as they make another attempt here. Ricardo didn't quite find the wall he was looking for, but he's getting up there in terms of alt percentage onto that blizzard and it's going to be the alt game i think for niagara especially because they keep losing people in this poke here but one thing i'm really worried about is cheese on this genji into a mei hanzo is uh not ideal not ideal at all uh, cheese definitely has a predisposition for certain heroes even the ash might be the name of the game there because the flight can only go so far dc actually not able to find the corner on this one Dragon's finding one and a lot of damage on more. Niagara now looks like they're coming back. She's trying to get in uh, some damage as wise. Arisa Lee just trying to get to the last of their coalescence. Now has that, but Redbeard paid the price, paid the ultimate price for that one. And more time is being shaved off the clock here. Niagara are running out of chances. They have one ultimate to work with. Soon it's going to be two as the sound barrier is good to go here. But Niagara University, they need to start some fights off the right foot here. Ricardo with the blizzard is very likely going to make this next fight moot unless Niagara can get around it here. But here it comes. Might be a wall into the alt. Mm. Big shatter. Big shatter indeed. Comes out. Players were not necessarily where they could have had that May wall out. That's the... Sound Bayer down. The only person who fell so far is Cheese. Juice Ring res both down. The tank core for the side of St. Peter's falling, but Juice Ring's back already. New shield take for him, though. This might be really deciding factor as Nachos falls. Nice freeze by Ricardo. In headshots and more. A lot of pressure on here. Grab out. Juice Ring has that one there. Salad Squad down. Velvet as well. Lots of supports falling on this one as this is St. Peter's all over this first point. Yeah, Niagara University now only have about a minute 25 for their attack. At this point, Cheese just needs to jump off, go for that reset, because 
I think they have one good fight left here. And it's going to be their best shot because St. Peter's only have that Dragon Strike ready to go. Jeez, you picked the Genji. It was all for this. That Dragon Blade better be huge or Niagara are going to lose the series. Yeah, it really does come down to that a lot. Redbeard can get the damage in, but Shatter first. Maywall out to make sure that does not matter. Apex falling in this one. No shield to assist their next little push oh. here. And then, oh no. He pulls his blade in front of a May with a full... Is there an endothermic blaster, I think it's called? Yes. Full ammo on it? Yeah, yeah that's going to uh, result in a freeze and shot every single time. Yeah, and there you have it. The result is clear. Brad Beard actually made it out. Good lord, the great escape. Hmm. But, okay, so... Doesn't really matter now. It's again, cheese. the big ultimate, the big reason why we saw the Genji fell flat and now the last second reaper swap is going to have to do something oh my god he just gets dinked by nachos Oof. what can he hit gotta respect these st peter's university snipers out there and then as they come up res comes out but apex follows throughout this beard beard now with a big flank looking on damage for one looking on damage for two but doesn't finish either of them just like that, majority of St. Peter's University players have found themselves a pick on this one. Grab out at the end, DC trying to make sure that he at least gets these out, but not going to matter. St. Peter's University take a handed 3-0 over Niagara University, ending out here on Hanamura. And Niagara University seems like they couldn't get a lot of these fights on the wrong foot. And I think we saw time and time again examples of just poor ultimate usage. Really, a couple sound barriers come to mind, of course. That Dragon Blade 1v1 with Cheese versus a May with what I think was 50 HP. These aren't ideal situations to use such powerful abilities, especially with the change nowadays where they don't come up as often as they used to. So you don't get to spam them like the old days. Mm -hmm. So as a result of a lot of that Niagara, end up going down 0-3, really unfortunate. St. Peter's just outclassed in every way. Yeah, uh, th that that's really fair. You look at you look across these roles and see what individuals did, and yeah, it, it adds up to St. Peter's tanks, DPSs, and supports all just really excelling at the role a little bit better. Now, mm -hmm. University, I said it before, and I'll I'll reiterate this: the only thing standing between them and this being a very very even matchup is Niagara coming through and just working on a bunch of little individual things. But we're going to go to a very short break, and then we got man Isaiah here for a little interview action from St. Peter's. We'll be back here in you know, sixty seconds.
And we are back. little interview action here with Isaiah, that's sharpshooter, or Rez, as you saw him playing for the St. Peter University squad. I'm FBI Tugboat, and here at Beatdown, got a couple questions coming right at Isaiah first. Isaiah, are you with us? Yep, I'm here. How do you hear it? Beatdown, you with me? Uh, yes, I am. There you go. First question, Beat, please. Yeah, so the, I guess the main thing I wanted to know, first and foremost, Rez, how did you guys feel going into this matchup? Did you guys do anything specific? Did you prep for Niagara? Or did you just play your standard composition, your standard game plans? Uh, yeah, we, 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 made, um, we made sure that we tried different things in practice, you know, the weeks leading up to this match. We wanted to do dive, you know, run Ryan Zarya and run a few different, uh, like, you know, tank combinations. And then, you know, it was just seeing what map we got for the week, you know, the map pool and seeing uh, what heroes would be best to play for that certain map. I'm with it. Yeah, it. So my question here, what if I remember right, you played the Ryan and the Diva, correct? Yes, that is correct. Gotcha. So just uh real simple. Which which your uh your favorite of those two? Which you prefer playing and why? Uh I think it's the Ryan. You know, I get to be a little aggressive. My uh you know, the healers give me good good enough heals so I can be aggressive and um, you know, try to make some plays and, you know, protect the team when necessary and it's just a f overall fun character to play. I think it speaks to the state of Overwatch to be asked the question, you like Ryan or D.Va, and then you say you like Ryan because of the aggression, right? D.Va that was invented as yeah. this dive tank, and that's, yeah. and that's the state of Overwatch these days. Yeah. 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 And I think to be fair, D.Va was always um, that kind of hero that, yeah, she could be aggressive, but also was really focused on peel. I think mm -hmm. Ryan is just like, of course... You do have to defend your team in a sense, but there's always been a focus on the, the Ryan v. Ryan mind game. And yep. I feel like a lot of, oh, yeah, charge you, uh, get your shield timing. So as soon as you land the first shatter because you get their shield timing, you're in his head. You win. Yeah, yeah definitely. It, it, exactly. it definitely takes, it takes a lot of, uh, there's like a, a practice game you could do in like, you know, um, one of the private Overwatch rooms where you could just do 1v1 Ryan battles and that, that helps with your timing for shatters and when to pin mm -hmm. and all that stuff. <laughs> Whoever said that there was no 1v1s in Overwatch? <laughs> yeah, seriously. Pete, any other questions? Uh, I guess the last thing I want to know from you, Rez, is uh, are there any other teams you're really concerned with here at EGF? Is there anybody you got your eye on? Uh, we definitely have a, a lot of you know, good competition in EGF this year. You know, We have uh, last year in the tournament, we you know, lost to Maris in the final. Hmm. And um, we definitely want to play Maris and Quinnipiac. We, we played them this year. We lost to them, but we definitely uh, have some good games ahead of us, and we we definitely want to show, um, show out for the competition. I'm with it. I'm with it. Now, uh, what I want to ask is, were there any compositions you were able to, uh, or that you weren't able to use out today that you guys are working on? You don't have to tell uh, me what they are now, but yeah, it, was there anything basically in, the, <laughs> in store here, excuse me, for, for St. Peter's that, uh, that we didn't get to see tonight? Yeah, we're working on different compositions. I mean, the good thing about the meta now in Overwatch is that a lot of players are definitely viable. But it's like the tank, I mean, most of the tank pool is definitely viable. So we're definitely trying to, you know, get ball in there and, you know, different heroes to try to throw off the competition a little bit. There you go. I'm with it. Mm -hmm. FBI Tugba here with Beatdown Boulevard, and we got Isaiah, that sharpshooter, in from St. Peter's University to give us a minute of his time after those games. We do appreciate that, Isaiah. All right, thank, thank you. you. Have a nice day. Yes, sir. Now, beat. We got. Uh, what was it next? I had it up here a second ago. Uh, oh no! Yeah. The game was RIT and Delaware. De gotcha. The there University go. of Delaware <laughs> and RIT. The voice coming in from the void to come in and help me out. There you go. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Tug Taps is here. Right, right, I'm watching here. I'm not looking at the text. All right, we want to appreciate you guys for watching. This is the EGFC, the collegiate side of the Electronic Gaming Federation. I'm FBI Tugboat. That's Beatdown Boulevard. You can check us out on our Twitters over there. Nope, other side. Over there. And we'll see <laughs> you guys. What? For Overwatch next Thursday, right, Beatdown? That's right. There you go. Uh, more Overwatch continues on here today, but uh, me and B will be on next week. That's what I was trying to say. There's plenty yeah. more here today. So stay tuned. They'll be with you in just a couple minutes.
Hello and welcome everybody for some good old-fashioned collegiate Overwatch coming through here. EGF ready to provide you the high-intensity action for your casting entertainment. Sir Waltham joined with Dryad today and on you and I's first game of the night, Dryad, will be University of Delaware versus RIT. How are we feeling? How are we feeling? Yeah, Delaware versus RIT. This is a match that I was waiting for just because we know RIT has been so strong recently. And uh, Delaware has also had a good performance, but it hasn't been quite at the level of RIT. So I really want to see them going against each other. They, they had enough time to maybe figure out what needs to work out, maybe a few scrims for the side of Delaware to make this match a little bit more even from what everyone ex is expecting. We know RIT has a huge fan base because of that. They have a lot of people supporting them. They have performed really well, regardless of the meta that we've seen recently, that it keeps changing. So I'm just excited to see how the scoreline is going to look. Uh, definitely. RIT walking into this with a statistical advantage. So they're going to be pretty happy about that. They're not going to want to give that up too easily. Sure enough, not to the University of Delaware. I mean, you know, again, Delaware, or excuse me, uh, Delaware, actually, with the 4-0. I'm getting my numbers all mixed up here, Dryad. But RIT at a 2-2 scoreline, if memory serves. So numbers, you know, definitely speak for these teams on their own merit. Yeah, they both had really, really good matches. Him, so a little bit tougher. So honestly, anything, this is why we can expect anything to happen. Uh, before, uh, we had some a really close match for RIT uh, when it was a little bit unexpected. So... A little bit of a roller coaster that both teams have definitely been going through, but overall, it should be a really, really good match that we can expect. I'm definitely hoping so. I am hearing the music that tells us we are going to be hopping in to these games here in just a brief moment, Dryad. But for those of you who maybe didn't catch some of the games earlier on, the way it's going to work, we're going to start off with, I believe it's going to be a control map. Then we're going to hybrid assault escort. Then, if necessary, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning with that control. As now we head into the game, and it's a nice little skyline there, Dryad. It definitely is, and it's a really pretty map when we look at it. Uh, but there's so much action when it goes that we kind of forget. But definitely something to be on the lookout for when we're looking at this map over right here in Busan. It's very known for seeing that Senyara being played out, maybe a few snipers if some of the teams there, and a lot of possibilities. But from what our teams are showing, it seems like for the side of RIT, we are going to expect more of a brawl style composition. While for Delaware, it's going to be the dive. So taking the advantage, going to the back line is going to be what Delaware needs to win here. Really look forward to seeing how Chaco Man plays up against Blue. That Hammond, that Wrecking Ball, going to be so weak against the hacks. If it gets caught out, and we're going to see how that exactly pans out. Blue does get hacked up, but is close enough to an exit to try to escape. It's pushed upon uh, by Essel on this Reaper, though. Dangerous opportunity here for Rochester. They can just continue swinging forward, knowing that this placement not going to be as big a factor. Now, the Diva's out of mech. It's all up to RIT. Just only the remainder of you of Delaware off the point. They clean it up really fast, and that's exactly what we expect from a brawl composition. They are going to take the advantage here, actually, pretty much pushing into their spawn, and that's just the confidence that we love seeing here for Delaware. They're going to be changing their composition, no more die for them. It's going to be, once again, their brawl, the mirror matchup that we love seeing, and now is where we're starting the difference between both of them, but Rochester should be having the ultimate advantage, knowing that they've had a composition for a little bit longer. Yeah, that ultimate economy gonna start to come in a little bit more effectively for Rochester as they do have heroes with more than 50% ult on the board. See Blue Jay trying to hold it down this front line, making it a little bit more threatening for that Reinhardt to come in. Eventually, however, Blue is gonna push ahead. It's gonna be Reinhardt v Reinhardt, but Essel comes in once again to intercept the action as that Death Blossom on the line, but he's gonna drop it right away. We'll hold on to it perhaps for the next fight as well. Rochester certainly seems to have this locked up so far. They clean it up, and there's a few kills that are coming through from the side of Delaware, but it doesn't seem like it's going to be quite enough, especially knowing that Chuckerman does have that EMP to come through. Also, that Dead Blossom, they are playing really aggressive. Nate has to get the EMP for himself if he wants to make something happen. And seeing that Chuckerman have to before, they should once again have the advantage. They're playing this really well. 
It's starting to look like a chicken or egg situation. Actual has the sound barrier for Nate has the EMP. The EMP goes out. Nate throws in a return EMP. Catches Actual, not able to drop the sound barrier, but University of Delaware still hemorrhaging members. Looks like the EMP was a little bit more detrimental to them. They are seeing ZP Link try to throw in the coalesce to keep their team alive and succeeding to that effect. RIT now continuing upwards towards this potential last fight. 90% and the kills kept coming through for the side of Rochester. This is a dominance that we were expecting from them. They will be pushing forward. They will try to not let anyone in and the last pick is all they need to win here. As we see the grab come out from a blue jay locking everybody down. The pain comes through the earth shatter. Absolutely unnecessary, but still gonna be committed. As we see the celebration sound barrier coming through. School. And this is, it might have been uh, the energy and the momentum that was going for the side of Rochester. They had definitely that energy going. They had more time to hold the composition and to build the ultimates faster. For the side of Delaware, though, I did like seeing the changes that they made throughout where they realized that the that dive style was not going to really work and they wanted to run the Ryan Taria better. It is definitely going to be a challenge now. They already have the advantage coming into this map and to this mecha base. You are already always expecting to see this brawl saw coming through so we're going to be seeing and maybe the biggest difference would be the dps lineup but overall for the tanks for the support it should be around the same we'll see exactly how they utilize this difference in the sombra versus the may the may has the opportunity to section off some of the opponents of university of delaware with those may walls to see what they can find but essel already throwing in some strong icicles we can see them charged up quite a bit the hack tries to come through from nate but the shield break or I guess the breaking of the hack with the shield from a link there to ensure that no benefit will be had. Again, the Maywall comes through the Reinhardt now looking a little bit uncomfortable. Blue has to back up, regroup with their team. We do see Essel on that May trying to drop right on the point. Not able to be taken down though. The focus fire from the Sombra not quite there as it needs to be. No. RIT are starting to swing in favor in terms of these kills. Blue Jay dangerously low though has to pop the personal bubble. And once that personal bubble is gone, they are going to be the focusing target of the Moira Coalescence. It will, however, be the fire strike that takes them down. However, not before RIT captures this point. Very late cool lessons for this out of burnout definitely made the entire difference. They wanted to use it earlier to try to take the advantage. Now, a sibling that is going to be is going to have the coalescence to use to engage as you should on this composition and the disadvantage come from the side of Zella where they have to figure out a way to come in and the wall is going to block Reinhardt. Yeah, excellent focus fire coming in from Delaware to break that wall as quick as possible and now Link FD gonna be taken down. University of Delaware goes in for it. The Earth Shatter comes out, doesn't seem to have landed onto too much. Heart the damage ticks come up, just did not the stun on the Moyer Coalescence, which was so oppressive in this fight. As we see Delaware now trying to push ahead to Zarya, leading the charge. Blizzard coming out from Essel, locks down Milk, does get taken down by the Icicles. Essel then flicking onto the Reaper, able to buy a lot of time on this point for the team. Reinhardt still on the point as well. Burnout trying their best, but there's only so much one Moira can do. Gonna be helped out with Nate, dropping that EMP, keeping everybody alive. This is a continuous fight, Dryad. And now Burnout was the one coming out from top of the Shatter Bullet coming through. So much action going on. This sound barrier, everyone wants to stay alive right now. And both teams are dropping at that sound barrier. Move and Actual gonna be trying to keep their teams up, but Rancer has a little bit of a better idea for University of Delaware that involves a Death Blossom of their own. It's gonna be the headshot onto Milk from Essel. May Lily looking to secure this point in a long fight, but RIT looks like they might just have it locked in, but the Reinhardt slowly pressing on to the Zarya. The personal player can only get you so much. It will be Blue Jay who ends up falling, but still, Rochester not giving any of this up, just continually bu building up that point progress as we take a little bit of a pause here. Yeah, a few kills that were coming for the side of Delaware, but unfortunately for them, it wasn't enough. And we already mentioned it, the longer that the fight goes, the more it's going to benefit the team that has it. And that means RIT was looking pretty good. Rochester, we talked about the dumbness that they had, and they are definitely struggling a little bit more. They should be able to come up on top at the end. Yeah, you definitely have to think so. RIT has been excellent at kind of rotating this fight out, rotating the respawns in to where they're never losing too many people at once. And so is Delaware, but a little bit to their detriment at this point, as we can see some of the replays from Sanctuary coming through. See Blue Jay dropping that nice grab. 
Yeah, definitely. There's a few highlights that we've seen so far in his Rochester aggressiveness. What enabled them to get this point and they didn't let it go. It seems like it's the same scenario that we're seeing right now. And once again, uh, CPL Link with the coalescence coming through has always pushed everyone all the way back, exactly using the tools the way that we wanted them to. And then now we're not going to we're going to keep going with this match and see what's going on now. It actually seems like there was a disconnect from the University of Delaware. Nate dropping it down for a brief moment. We'll be coming back in, but the question is, can the University of Delaware even make it back? Doesn't seem like it's going to be easy. 93% already on the time bag, and it just puts more pressure to them. Maybe Burnett can touch, oh, but the grab is going to help them stay there. A very high lob coming in for Blue Jay helps to lock. I would say lock down, but lock up is more appropriate. Everybody on the opposing team keep them from getting point, or at least make them be a little bit more rushed when the grab does finally release them. Maywall really putting the separation onto the right heart, onto the Reaper. It's gonna be so difficult, but Rams are almost getting booped off, but their opponent has a few other choice words for them. It's gonna be RIT taking the win. Just like, the, just like that, RIT does take the advantage, advantage, take the first point, but anything can happen in the future map, so we definitely keep, need to keep an eye. Delaware seems like to have seems to have the right idea, but it's struggling a little bit in figuring out the way that they want to engage, mostly because they stay way too long into point, when that's just not necessarily benefiting them. I did like how similar the compositions were, and there were only a few differences that we could highlight, uh, but overall, I don't think it's a matter of having this mirror matchup, but who is going to be more aggressive when you're playing this brawl style. So if you're going to be seeing another composition, that might put another composition to the table on how they want to engage. Yeah, and, and to that point, I think that Essel playing that May was looking very good, not just because, you know, the team was getting aggressive with those May walls, but because those May walls seem to cause at least the littlest bit of hesitance coming in from Delaware. So not only are you strengthening your own ranks, you're slowly weakening the opponents. I think it was a really good move there, and they executed it very well. They did, and I do like seeing the May coming up on top, but unfortunately, it just, for the side of Delaware, wasn't quite enough, so I do want to see something else changing. Um, even if they want to keep the May for other maps, you have to figure out the way to engage, and it mainly falls with a lot of pressure for the tanks, making sure they have enough space for uh, the DPS lineup, for the support lineup, to get the space to get some more value like they want to. And they are playing this composition that we haven't seen that often recently in Overwatch, so I'm very curious to see if they want to try something Something else. Well, there's a lot of opportunity to be a little bit more flexible here, particularly from RIT. They're going to want to keep that score streak high. But I mean, you know, if you think you're at the top of the pack, you have that opportunity to be a little bit more flexible, to get a little bit more experimental with it. So I think if anything, they'll be the ones that are more comfortable being that experimental, being that flexible uh, team. Delaware kind of has to stick to what they think is going to be best, not what they can try to pull some tricks out with. But I do like seeing the adaptation that we saw from Delaware, so I do expect them to make the changes necessary. If they think they can win the mirror matchup, I do want to see it very early on. And they did try to do it um, right on the first point, and they just didn't get quite enough value. But that we do need to take into account that was a control map, so anything could happen there. Now we're getting close to the next matchup, so it should be a little bit more even. We're getting close to Blizzard World, and for the side of the defenders, they should be Rochester, so you're trying to hold it for as long as they can. Definitely likes the look of a Blizzard World. I always want to ride on those rides, but sadly, we're stuck casting in the commentator's booth. Not able to get our ride tickets, our, our, our prizes, not even visit the Snack Shack, which is the true shame here. But you're absolutely right, Rochester going to be starting off on that defense. So we already see they're rolling out with that Ryan Zarya once again. They're not going to get too divey with it. They're not going to get too uh, crowd controly with it. Just some good old slugfests. And from what I would see so far, they're going to keep running this Brawl style, which is not necessarily bad. I do like seeing this, uh, but it just means that they have to have the first engagement. So if CP Link is on the more, uh, the Coalescence to engage is going to be essential rather to use it at the end of the match. For the side of Zella, where on the attack is, do you have Nade on the Widowmaker, that double sniper composition coming up on top? And the double snipers, but the snipers operating in very different ways. Rants are going to be able to wear down the shields of Link FD a little bit more proficiently than their partner Nate might be able to. As we see Delaware taking this high ground, a very advantageous spot for those snipers. We see the Roadhog Blue 17 trying to push up, break, or whittle down that Rhine shield as well. Roadhog can be pretty good for that if you let him, but you don't want to let him get too close to Essel with that Reaper. can really start to put the hurt on. Blue Jay now starting to cut down their opposing team. Essel is going to be using that to unleash the collar, push forward ahead with the damage dealing. 
and now with the defense so far coming through well for our team. And that was a really, really good cleanup once again from the side of Brochu. So they're about to have that blossom pretty soon. Now their main concern is to build that EMP. University of the Warriors making a few changes. Again, I do like seeing this from them. If it doesn't work, then try to figure out as soon as possible. They're going to be having this Roadhog. They're able to pull a few of them, try to get some value out of this tank lane. That should be enough for them to take the high ground. As we see, Blue 17 way in the back, trying to just use those long distance shots from Roadhog's kit to try to whittle down the Rhine Shield without putting themselves into much danger. They'll try and perhaps absorb a little bit of damage, but CP Link gonna be thrown in the Coalescence, taking it down Aline. An excellent opportunity here now that the University of Delaware further weakened RIT. Once again, continues to push the advantage, and now a little support on support violence, but it's actual who comes in and steals the kill. Interesting play there as RIT continues to fight in the souvenir shop. We didn't need to get the kills in blue, never stood a chance. And they didn't even have to use that many ultimate abilities that Coalescence did come through right at the beginning, but we know that Moira should be able to build his ultimate very, very soon. So in the meantime, for the side of University of Delaware, they need to, they almost have the original abilities, but they have to hurry up. They don't have that much time left if they want to make this happen. They have to get it in at least two fights for them to have the confidence to push it all in the way into second point, and that EMP is going to be a challenge. Yeah, keep an eye out for Chaco Man of Burnout. Has that transcendence, but they may have to avoid this Sombra if possible. Sombra actually going to try to spot him out. It looks like Chaco has the clue into where they are. RIT They're throwing in the grab, not really comboing the uh, EMP with it. Instead, it's going to be Blue using the whole hog, committing to it. Delaware wants to win this fight this time around and going to be investing the ultimates to do that. The EMP does come onto the three remaining players for the side of Delaware. And it's just going to be a quick cleanup from RIT who continues to dominate. And it seems like they were going to struggle a little bit more with the T blog at that initial pick, but it didn't seem to be quite enough. Now it seems like he's going to swap the composition again. Do not be satisfied with their results yet. And now a Reinhardt will be played, but only one minute remaining and a lot of ultimate abilities from the side of Russia should to hold the defense. We talk about the coalescence. We always talk about the shatter as well to also push everyone all the way back to try to get more value with the damage. And this is one last opportunity for Delaware to make something happen. We'll see if they can make it happen. They're gonna try by using the Gravitic Flux, but this hack on to the Sigma prevents that from getting any value. Every single ult, it seems like, on the side of University of Delaware, getting cut down, interrupted, and disrupted as it goes. It's once again, RIT pushing ahead, making sure that nobody walks away from this fight. And I'm not really sure if anyone is going to be able to touch your 20 seconds remaining enough time, but they do have to swap into someone that's a little bit faster. We do see Lucio will be trying to get here as well as the Moira, but with the aggression that we see from Rochester, they're not going to let them get the point just as easy. You see Burnout trying to give their team the healing to allow them to get right on the point. Two seconds left, somebody does make a last moment touch. It's the Lucio, the Reaper popping onto the point are going to be saying the grab come out from Rochester just to lock down everybody else. University of Delaware stood no chance on that push. A rough spot and for that they'll pick up 0%. Really, really good control of the ultimate economy from the side of Rochester is what allowed them to win. They had a very good initial engagement into the first fight, and just like that, they were able to take control. We are seeing that coalescence always coming through just in time and allowing everyone to oh play for the side of the enemy. You're forced to go a little bit back, make sure you're staying alive, and it also, of course, healing the team. So, doing everything that you can expect, really, really good job as we expected from the side of RIT, but anything can happen. University of Delaware might have some secrets into how they want to hold the defense. Certainly, and one thing I noticed, RIT, I was gonna say they have good ult rotations, but it just seems like they're able to negate University of Delaware's ults so much more effectively. The Sigma goes in for the Gravitic Flux, they get the hack on him. The Lucio goes in for the, e for the sound barrier, the EMP comes out, the shatters can get blocked. Everything like that, it just seems like University of Delaware's not being allowed their abilities like the Rochester team is using theirs especially because yeah i do like seeing the changes when you find out that something's not working but for the side of delaware we saw these changes happening three times and it didn't really allow them to build any ultimate ability which is essentially what they need to at least they control the point so now they are in a lot of pressure to try to hold they have to make sure they're having those first engagements and this is a good start they are going to try to do the same thing that rochester did 
which was having their brawl style playing really, really aggressive, getting those early picks, and just like that, hoping they can win. But one key factor will always be the Sombra, that EMP, once it's ready, is going to be really, really good for them to take control. We do see Rochester on this attack, ready to poke in Essel, just trying to throw in some rockets early on. Nate on that high ground gets knocked off, jostled, if you will. And already the lineup for RIT is getting up into the face of University of Delaware. That soldier has to drop off high ground and commit the healing beacon to that. CP Link taken down, so RIT already lacking in these numbers. At least they would be. The Tracer didn't pick up the kill on to Nate Chaco Man. Certain to deliver some effects of their own. And University of Delaware so far taking this a little bit slow as they need to. They're calm burning off as much time on the clock as they can, but they need to be very aware of Essel on this aerial threat without the soldier being there to be a very dangerous situation. Lean having to try to run away as they do get dangerously low because of that direct impact from the rocket. Essel now going up into the air and receiving the damage amplification from Mercy. Burnout throwing in the coalescence, trying to keep their team alive, and more importantly, try to burn down those aerial units. They do not want to let that bar get too much vision over them. And this is a tough spot for them because they don't have anyone who's going to be able to counter this far. They're doing a lot of damage, but they are doing their rotation necessary to make sure they're staying alive. The barrage will come through after this hack, and that might be all that this team needs to take the victory they want to push forward. The big hack onto the far is going to tell the entirety of Delaware that Essel has that rocket barrage. Just going to be looking to set it up, creeping over the shack right into the Reinhardt shield, but gets hacked out in the middle of it. Branzer, excellent awareness there coming through from the Sombra. Blue not able to sustain themselves with the shield alone, will be dropping it now. Looks like Rochester finally got the damage they needed to. The grab goes out, and it's going to try to lock everybody down, but University of Delaware just does not have the manpower to really capitalize upon it. It looks like the Reds are going to come through, only further reinforcing Rochester as they clear off this point. They are so close to finishing that first tick. They're going to get it, as well as the second point from Blizzard World. Very, very fast map that we saw. RIT definitely coming up on top, knowing exactly how they wanted to play. They knew that they needed the ultimate economy to benefit them before they were able to properly push forward, and that's exactly what they did. I do appreciate that Delaware was, were trying to make the changes. They were making the rotations to try to stay alive, but it didn't seem like it was quite enough. So they still have a lot of work to do when trying to figure out. They still have one last map if they want to make the comeback. It is going to be one final opportunity, one potential final opportunity here for Delaware. And then, you know, if they do surpass that opportunity, they have to do it again and again. They have to win three more maps in a row. That puts them in a rather tough corner. Will they do it is going to be the big question, but you'll only find out after this break. So stick around.
Hello and welcome back from our brief break, everybody, to EGF Season 2. Sir Waltham Andrad once again casting University of Delaware versus RIT. RIT taking a 2-0 lead over what looks like a pretty dominant fashion compared to the University of Delaware. Definitely, and just having that full hold on Blizzard Royal is not easy, but it just shows the dominance that RIT has right now. They are doing a really, really good job. And one thing, though, that we have to point out is that they've only really been able to run this Brawl Stall composition so far, and it's worked. So I do like seeing this, but if Delaware wants to take the advantage, I would like to see them trying to push a little bit of that advantage, maybe forcing RIT out of this composition. That might be the win condition that they need right now, and it's not going to be easy, but as as we get close to what could be your last map, this is the last opportunity Delaware has to win. And as we look ahead, it seems like Hanamura going to be our next map moving ahead. So how do you think that kind of affects, you know, whether we'll see Dive or Brawl, you know, I guess in, a, in, a, in an overall sense, Dryad? From what we've seen so far, it just seems like teams feel more comfortable playing this Reinhardt. And here in Hanamura, we've seen a lot of variety recently and looking at the current meta, uh, there's different compositions the teams decide to run, but overall, uh, for the side of uh, the of Rochester, we've again we've only seen the brawl so far. So if they want to uh, keep winning and keep having that dominance, I would not change the composition. I think it would be very interesting to see if the way that they engage with maybe a dive style, but I don't think that's going to happen, especially here in Hannah Moria. And then for the side of Delaware, we already see that they are also hinting that they're going to be playing this brawl. So with the same mirror that we saw before and the difference is going to be in the dps lineup we will see if the double snipers pay off for delaware nate and rancer once again going to be trying to go up against the opposition of rochester we see nate taking that high ground positioning taking a couple shots into the supports and body shot into the right heart mid swing as link fd not gonna be too bothered by that they do have a lot of healing coming through and blue jay able to take down a rancer it looks like that zarya caught out that hanzo just a little bit more than he should have allowed as we see rit now just confidently holding this choke and it doesn't seem like university of delaware has too much aggression to push through with just yet will be sl taken down that means the tanks can have the opportunity to get a little bit more comfortable here blue however seems to be holding up just a bit dryad yeah, they are doing a good job so far, but we'll see how long they should be able to make this last. They're playing very, very aggressive. And this could be a risky, but so far, only one pick that we saw before. Now, Nate gets another one. Nate does get another one. This might open it up even further for University of Delaware, as we see Nate focusing down that main line area. Reaper trying to strafe, trying to avoid the shots. Still looking like it's going to be Essel debating on if they want to get to point, but eventually they'll just turn tail and run. That was a really good engagement, maybe even surprising to see from the side of Delaware. We're looking at the performance that we saw before. Essel does get the pick into Nate, but this shouldn't be really a concern as they have so much time remaining. He does get picked at the end, but once again, they have the spawn to come back a lot of time as well for the side of the attacker. So now what they need to figure out is the way that they want to engage. Roger, they're doing a good job trying to take the high ground here, but it's not going to be easy. They don't have any ults coming up soon that would benefit them to command. It all depends on him getting the EMP. As we look ahead, the grab from Milk is online, but no dragons to combo with it just yet. Rancer on the slow build to getting them and getting that big combo coming through here. Choco Man gets the EMP online. The question is, how do they respond? Nate throws in the Imprecise at a dangerously low level of health. Sound Barrier coming out from Actual just to try to keep the team alive and reinforce Rochester. And that's exactly what it's going to do. Delaware gets swept off their feet and sent back to spawn. Blue Jay has been consistently good in getting those picks. I absolutely love seeing this from this area. The grab always coming up, saving everyone else and doing a lot of damage along with the synergy that the team has. But now it's going. Oh, that was a really good shot. Oh, no. He gets okay. He falls, but that was worth it. I think they still have a lot of time. Four minutes, thirty seconds remaining for them. Now is the risky situation to try to get this high on a little bit of a risky play from Nate. We are seeing the abilities that come in from ZP Link, trying to get the anti nades, trying to get the sleep darts through. Milk now the one with the grab, tucks it right in behind the enemy lines, and with the dragons coming on line, not a lot to resist it. Everybody gonna get cleaned out by Rancer, or at least half the team. That's half enough for me. Delaware now looking to rush on to this point. It's only a matter of time before they start getting more and more ticks. However, Chaco Man is ready to drop the EMP. 
Yeah, they're going to give them two to take the net. This target might come through, but Nate is coming up from top of those kills. Chaco Man drops the EMP, but is brought dangerously low on their own. It's going to be the nano boost on to the Reinhardt for the defending team. Nate on this high ground in the way back. It's going to be Delaware putting up a decent score on this board. Doing really good. They still have a lot of time left in case these go to another round. And it just seems like we, we can we can see the aggression that comes from Rochester when they're able to play this brawl. But when, when you're defending here in Hanamura, it gets a little bit more challenging. Now where we're going to be seeing them attack, that might give them a better opportunity to try to match this time bank the University of Delaware has. But that was overall a really good performance, Nate. Definitely coming up on top when the spawns were coming through, when everyone was trying to stagger for a little bit longer. He just got to you and that was all they needed to win yeah and the unfortunate part there for rit was that they used the grab as well as the sound barrier in the same fight meaning they didn't have anything to respond with from delaware or to delaware when that grab and dragons came out so we're gonna see if rit can perhaps turn their fortunes once again to get another win it looks like the sim might just be coming out but delaware is going to keep rolling the dice with the double sniper and uh, once again, this might be a little bit risky when you're playing the rest. The rest of the composition is going to be Brawl, but this DPS lineup is going to be the Ash and the Hands. So that puts a lot of pressure into for for the tank line to be able to properly engage and to have the confidence. You need to rely on Nate and Rainsir to try to get a few picks also right at the beginning. And that might not be easy here. They have to have a really good positioning, making sure they're staying alive, but it's definitely possible. They have to play, once again, very, very aggressive, pushing with the Ryan with the Saria, everything that they can with the bubbles to try to get a lot of energy. But Rochester has other plans. They do have that Symmetra is going to be played. Let's see if S still gonna be throwing in a teleporter to get the team right tucked up close to point. It's gonna be the drop of the teleporter, but no, it's not gonna be the side of RIT pushing in with the teleporter. Link FD brought dangerously low. Needs some backup and needs it quick as Essel's only gonna get more powerful as this fight goes longer. Both Reinhardt's brought down and now no shields to really worry about from either side. It's just going to be the Zarya's in terms of mitigating that damage. Milk, however, taking a walloping as they have to back out, tinkering around that 100 HP zone. That gives Essel enough time to set up, and they're going to be more than happy with that. As now, RIT still holds a good position here. Even if they suffer some losses, it's going to be painful for Delaware to push in. It's exactly what we're going to be seeing. The Coalescence coming out, and the push from Delaware results in only pain. Even when they lose a few players, Bluja is here coming up on top of the kills, making sure this find of blows happening. Just like that, they will be taking first point. Now they have to play really aggressive. That opportunity once again for the snowball is there. They just need to make sure to engage Hello. very, very early on, catching Delaware a little bit of unaware, but we know that Burner does have the colors to keep everyone alive to engage. So it shouldn't be an easy fight for them. They need to be very aware of how close Blue Jay is to that grab. One Zarya bubble or one Zarya grab can lock everything down. Brants are getting forced off the high ground, barely makes their way with their life, but now Blue Jay has the shooting gallery available to them instead. Gonna take it up towards the spawn side, right on the point. Get ready to throw in the grab. Does connect Burnout using the coalescence to try to keep their team alive. Link throwing in an earth shatter as well. Boop responding with the Salvator actual, rocking one of their own, in fact. Looking like Rochester has the abilities to come online. Rancer throwing in the dragons, trying to buy a little bit of space by themselves. Any sort of clearance they can. No kills, however, as this is now just going to be stall staggers coming out from Delaware. Eventually, they will fall one by one as that point progress takes up for RIT. It doesn't seem like for the side of Delaware that there's anything they can do. They will be trying to touch point, but it might just be too late. And on top of that, you're going to have Chocolate Man with that death blossom. That should be all. And they actually do get more time. This team is unstoppable once they have that energy going. That is quite disappointing, if I'm being honest. It looked like Delaware finally had some footing. They finally put down a very good score on the board. But RIT sees that, not intimidated at all, puts an even better time on the board. The Delaware's. That's kind of the backbreaker for them at that point. Definitely, and uh, it was just a surprise, first of all, to see Delaware doing so good right at the beginning on their attack. They knew exactly what to do, what to play. It seems like they did have a lot of preparation, but there are certain teams that are very good at attacking, not so much defending here in Hanamura. So this might be one of the cases. They do have the opportunity to try to attack again and see if they can make it a little bit closer, have that dominance, and they just worry about the defense for it to be good because Rochester 
had a very interesting strategy right at the beginning. We, when we see a Symmetra, we definitely expect the Teleporter to come through. And Delaware saw this and they pushed all the way back to make sure that the Teleporter didn't get any value. But the Teleporter never came. They didn't even need it. Once again, it was all just the picks that were coming from the side of the Saria that enabled him to take the point at the beginning. Yeah, it definitely looked like a little bit of a practice play coming in from RIT. We'll see if they have any more up their sleeves as we continue on with Hanamura. Now RIT once again on this defense. University of Delaware, two minutes to get any points on the board that they can. We're going to be seeing them not come out with the double sniper this time around. It's going to be Nate on the Widow with Rancer on the Echo. See if they can get some good duplicates in. But Essel taking Nate out of the fight early means that now Rochester already has that man advantage, that power advantage when this Widow is no longer able to take your head clean off. They're not going to push it, though. They're going to be a little bit courteous there. They do keep Essel on that little overlook, making sure that nobody can too comfortably get settled up there, especially since the Widow threat has now been established. RIT continuing to just throw in the damage, and University of Delaware are not getting as aggressive as they might need to. Playing this very, very aggressive from the side of Essel, but that should be just enough now. Delaware does have a big challenge here, trying to push through this choke is not going to be easy. They do need the speed. They do have both to try to give them speed, but it doesn't seem like it's going to be now. Maybe the Shatter could help them out. Uh, taking down the Echo will certainly help as well, and then the Reinhardt, the res comes through, but because of that, nobody's able to receive the healing, and that includes Link FD. Now the Coalescence comes out, and Delaware does get some points on the board. It's not going to be a draw for them, at least not yet, with this progress being made on first. They should be able to get this point, and now the challenge is going to be into second, just oh. like it happened before. As well gets another kill, just hiding. Trying to get some value, but finally wow. he gets taken down. It's not the first time that we see this. We saw it before on the Reaper, but now he definitely has to play with the team into the second point, figuring out how they want to play. And the ultimate economy definitely benefiting this out of Rochester because Delaware had to use everything to get that point. There's not going to be a whole lot left in the tank for University of Delaware. They'll have to try to get any progress they can. They can't even capitalize on the late death of Essel as those quick respawns do come into effect once that first point is capped. Essel has this tire. Going to wait to bide their time. Make this push as late as possible for University of Delaware. Takes it down two, and then immediately the follow-up is there from RIT. They don't even have to use too many ults off the back end of this. They're saving that for the last fight. Ezul does get three at the end, and they're looking pretty good so far. Only 20 seconds remaining for this side of the attack. I see that we want to make something happen. Delaware does have a challenge. No ultimate's coming through. Maybe that duplicate can help them out, but they have to build it fast. This is the last cruise that they have if they want to win here. If not, we know that Rochester is going to play aggressive into the next round. We now see the Gravitic Flux coming online, ready to lock down anybody who tries to touch point. It's going to be getting the Reinhardt, who's not long for this world. Chaco Man has the focusing beam. And even if Blue Jay actually getting to eat onto Milk's grab, an excellent opportunity here. But it seems like Rochester still gonna have this numbers, have the raw force that comes on a line Rancer. We take the duplicate form of the Sigma. Everybody getting locked down by that grab coming in from Chaco Man. Not able to do a lot of damage, but sometimes the ult's all you need when it comes to that Echo Chaco Man. You see the focusing beam to take Rancer out of that duplicate form. Nate, not long with the Widow either as it looks like Rochester is going to hold without the second point getting capped. And it looked really, really close after that first point, but that second engagement is always very, very challenging for teams. Now, the biggest opportunity for Rochester is to try to play a little bit more aggressive, like they know, like we know they like to do. And it just has to happen with the same brawl set that they've been playing. They know they can take the advantage into that mirror matchup, which has been happening over and over again. For the side of Delaware, if we're going to see something different, it has to happen very early on. Essel has done a really good job so far into getting those kills like we can see. And I think this is also going to be a key for the win here. Uh, also, just something of lesser note. First time I've seen a Zarya get duplicated by an Echo in a very long time. Usually the Echoes might not be so confident they can get that charge, that energy up to build a grab up fast. But... We saw it performed very well there, so many congratulations. A an exciting thing overall, but now it's going to be up to the University of Delaware to defend. They have to defend for three minutes against Rochester. They have to not prevent a full cap on first if they want to win, and they have to prevent no progress on second if they want to draw. 
And I do like the pace that they're making. The May is always very, very strong. If you want to isolate the main tank, the Reinhardt, that's going to be very, very good. But it has to happen very early on. For the side of Rochester, they might do may, they might try to use a teleporter this time if they want to take the advantage. Even going into the high ground would be ideal, and that would deny the possibility of May getting any value at all. Uh, now with Rochester having foregone the teleporter once before, it's going to set a little bit of confusion to come through. RIT once again not going to be setting up with the teleport, instead just going to be looking to push right on ahead. It's going to be Chaco Man taking down Nate to start in University of Delaware, already in a very terrible spot, losing one of each roll. The clean up for the rest of them sure to be there. The Icicles towards that Lucio boop, going to barely get away into the waiting fist of ZP Link as now it's just all point cleanup for Rochester. Chalk Command with the center turret definitely allowing them to take more space and putting a lot of pressure into Delaware when they are also trying to make sure that they are able to stay alive. This didn't quite happen and it's not looking very good for them as they don't have any ultimates coming through for the next fight. They just need to make sure they don't get picked. That's pretty much all you can expect. And Nate is also once again playing aggressive, gets taken down, but luckily for him, Tracer has a reef has spawned to come back. As we look now, University of Delaware does come back in a very quick fashion. Immediately, Milk jumping on to point to try to defend. You need somebody on that point at all times. ZP Link taken down. A great opportunity given that that Moira is not going to be able to do a lot of healing, and your response are going to get by much quicker. We do see Rochester continuing to push ahead using this Blizzard from Essel to try to lock down the point even more. It's going to have to be Nate playing in a small area outside of the Blizzard, but that just lines up easy headshots for Essel. And with that, it's going to be an easy one tick given over, and RIT takes this 3-0. to zero. Asshole also coming up on top at the end. We already seen how aggressive this player is, and it's just because they know how to get value out of it every single time. RIT, as expected, do you get the 3 0. And for the side of University of Delaware, they had a big opportunity here in Hanabora, but it didn't seem like it was enough. As we can see here, the dragons into the grab, a classic combination that uh, took a little bit of a time, but they eventually got it set up. So an excellent play there. Got some excellent results from Delaware, just not quite enough. Two minutes left after your first attack. Still pretty good, but not enough to compare to RIT's three. Oh, a thrilling game so far, Dryad. Yeah, and if it's just taken into account that the the when we saw Delaware really coming up on top was when they were using those combos, when they were able to use maybe that grab and those dragons if it's necessary. And there's a few other combinations they can make, maybe with that EMP if they wanted to really use that Sombra. So if they are going to look into this, try to make a bar view, try to figure out what went wrong, that's definitely one of the possibilities. And for this side of Rochester, they are unstoppable all the time. And definitely unstoppable so far, it seems. As we look ahead, however, we do have a little bit of an interview coming in with Link FD in just a moment. We're going to give them a brief break so they can catch their breath after that absolute sprint. But no, let's stick around. You will be seeing that here in just a few moments.
Hello and a welcome back, everybody. Thank you for sticking around. And as a little treat for your loyalty here, we've got a special interview lined up. It's going to be Link FD from RIT. I like that little rhyme there, but Link, <laughs> congratulations on your win Thank over you. Thanks Dollar. for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Got a few questions here for you, but I really want to get into your mindset here because RIT has been pretty powerful these last few weeks. What was your mindset going up against Delaware? Was this another day at the office? So before each of our matches, we always want to mainly just focus on the match in front of us. So we, when we're looking at each, when we're analyzing the game, when we're, we're playing, we have to keep in mind what they're playing. And we're usually sticking on around like the same comp that we were running, Ryan Zarya, mm -hmm. Sombra, and Reaper. But uh, our mentality, we just, we just want to just focus on one game at a time, pretty much. And it's been paying off. Yeah, and on that same topic, I did want to ask you, so did you ever feel like you had to change the composition? Maybe in Hanamura, would things seem a little bit closer? Were you considering playing something else? Or was there something that you had the confidence that was going, was going to work out from beginning to end? So on point, on the first round of Hanamura, when we lost the first point, we were considering to switch to the uh, Sigma and Hog. But since we had ultimates online, we decided to stay. And we were also going to switch off, I think, our support line off as well. But we ended up coming up with a, an interesting strat on the attack with the Symmetra, which worked out pretty well. So, But usually we stick with the same comp because we're comfortable with it. But if we want to try something, we'll try it out. If it doesn't work, we'll usually go back to what we're comfortable with. Yeah, and I have one question, uh, one last question that I have. So I do want to ask for that Symmetra teleport that was going to happen at the beginning. So it seemed like she was going to teleport, she was going to put the teleporter down, but it just never happened. Uh, everyone just kept walking forward. Was that planned? Was this something that you guys were planning to do? Yes, or just that, was, that was intentional. <laughs> we, just, we, we were trying to juke him out and basically obtain the space that was in front of us because they all went back to point. And that was our entire, our entire plan for that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I think it worked out fantastically. But uh, before we let you go here, Link, give me the scoop. Are there any teams you're looking forward to facing or that you think are going to be some a little bit more competitive of a game? Uh, for me, I'm looking forward to our matches against Arlington and Maris because they're the mm -hmm. other undefeated teams. So hopefully those matches will be really exciting to watch and fun to play as well. Well, I know well, I'll be tuning in for it, but thank you, Link, for coming in and answering a few of our questions. Before I let you go, I do like to give the opportunity for any shout-outs you might feel are necessary. I just want to shout-out to all my team and my manager, my manager, Jack, for everything that you guys done. So thank you, guys. All right. Well, fantastic, Link, once again. Thank you for coming in here, answering our questions, and congratulations over your win. Congratulations you. on your win over University of Delaware. Thank you. And with that, Dryad, that concludes our presentation of RIT versus University of Delaware. But folks at home, don't want you to think that the presentation is all over. We do have another game happening here in just a little while. So stay tuned. We'll keep you up to date. EGF Season 2 will be back in a little bit.
Hello and welcome back everybody to EGF Collegiate Season 2. We're going to be going into our fourth game of the day, University of Connecticut versus St. John's University. Sir Waltham and Dryad back at it once again, ready to give you some more casting entertainment. Dryad, how do we feel? Oh, this is going to be really, really interesting to see, um, especially because when we look at UConn and St. John's University, these two teams have done, um, so have had some wins, but also some losses so far. So I'm not really sure who's really going to take the advantage here. It really, once again, it just depends on what they have won to run here. Uh, but overall, it shouldn't be the same sort of stomp that we saw in the match before, where RIT was completely dominant. And it should be a little bit more closer, maybe more composition that we can see. Yeah, these teams actually having very similar win score lines. I believe it's one and three for both ends. One win, three losses. So both teams going to look to be trying to separate themselves from that bottom of the pack area. And a good win here will do it for either end, I think. Definitely, and they do want to try to get some wins for themselves because it's been really hard, and we do have to recognize that these teams have already faced uh, the best teams, the top teams, so that might be why they have some of the losses, but overall, it's been pretty even for both of them. It's a really interesting matchup where we see kind of no, not the best teams, not the worst teams, it's just that kind of middle ground where we really want to figure out who's going to come up on top. And I personally am always going to be hoping for more than just three games here at the EGF. I like seeing those four, those five, maybe the even rarer game six, but I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Let's just settle this one map at a time. And now I like these teams. 
Um, but I like the map set even better as we do get the opportunity to take a little bit of a look at it here. I do believe we will be starting off on Bu San Dryad. Yeah, Busan is um, one map that we already saw, and we already have kind of the understanding of what teams are most comfortable playing, but there's a lot of things to think into account when we're looking at this matchup, and is that not all these teams, not all these college teams decide to go with the meta. They usually just try to pick whatever they're good at and trying to get value out of it. That's exactly what uh, the representative for RIT was telling us, uh, that they were just playing what they were comfortable in, they were really good at Brawl, and they just made it work over and over again and this might be one of the cases that we see for St. John's University in UConn where it can be really really close but it just comes to what they want to play if they want to counter or if they want to pick to if they want to play to what their strengths. Certainly something to consider here and as we look beyond Abu San it's going to be Blizzard World past that Hanamura and if necessary Havana, Nepal etc what have you. But now I am getting word that we will be heading into Busan here in just a moment, Dryad. Any uh, thoughts as to what the compositions we might see coming out are? Well, for Busan, I think it really depends on what we're looking at. When we're looking at makeup, we can always expect that Brawl to come through. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, the opportunities for Sanctuary to see that Sniper coming through, maybe a Widowmaker, even though it's not really meta. Again, teams are pretty much playing what they feel comfortable in. So it's just really um, a matter of what they've seen and how much they want to adapt for, to what's around them. And we already have maybe some signs of what they want to run. We are seeing very, very different compositions so far. They can definitely change as the doors open, but we are definitely seeing on this maker base that we're all coming to you from St. John's. Interesting that universe, UConn is not going to be opting into that. They're going to be going for the wrecking ball. Might be a little bit harder to navigate that giant flying ball into the areas where it might be most optimal, but we'll see if a rabbit can do it. As we see the Genji also going to be coming in from St. John's University. Something we haven't seen too often, but excited to see how Bizarre performs as the Yukon begins to make this rotation. It's going to be Q trying to get into the back line, looking for any opening on these targets. Not a whole lot of break to shut down this Tracer, but Q already taking quite a bit of damage. Rich now certainly going to be aware, keeping eyes on those flanks, keeping ears open for the Tracer as that McCree going to be able to shut them down. However, it's Ventique, who is going to be able to get the first kill onto Rich DPS lineup. Now opening for Yukon, as now they're going to start making their way to point. There's not much St. John's can do here, but because Yukon is starting to make that rotation towards point and leaves the escape open a little bit more for St. John's to get away. The of angle definitely giving the benefit to Yukon with the soldier getting those kills. Now they just have to simply clean up that they already have the percentage that they're winning on point, which is an ideal situation for them. And the fight lasted way too long just because they were feeling very comfortable on the high ground, but we didn't really see a fight besides when, once again, the soldier was trying to get a few picks for himself. That flux up from Yukon is going to be ready for an early initiation and that rally as well. So that's one of the biggest differences that we see in the composition. A great start from St. John's as Rich takes down Q, exactly what that McCree needs to do in this type of situation. He's going to be thrown behind Noon from the high ground. Mercy popping the bout to get the res, going to be allowing themselves to get the regen here, despite being brought critically low by Rich. So it's just a natural regeneration that comes through. Ventique now on the opposite high ground we saw them on earlier, really trying to rain down with that tactical visor, finding some great advantage here. As we see them pushing ahead, the damage boost got to be giving Benteki that opportunity. 50% are ready for Yukon, and they're looking pretty good. The ult economy, yeah, they did use a lot there, but it was necessary to win. Now the biggest challenge for them is going to be that blade coming through from Bussar. He needs to get value out of it if they want something to happen. They don't want the point to get more percentage on the side of the enemy team, and it has to be a very early engagement for it to get value. We can see Rabbit taking a little bit of a nap and using those adaptive shields to really sustain a whole heap of abuse there. As we see, now the Rabbit Flux is going to be coming through. It's going to be Mitt Ben trying to hold up, keep, their, keep the team of St. John's from really pushing forward. And so far, Yukon looking great, not letting St. John's get anywhere near the point. They're definitely having that confidence, and once again, the longer this goes, it's already 90% for you, and they're looking pretty comfortable, and they are going to have the ultimate abilities once again for this next fight, once and Jens has not used them once. These are going to be going in with the blade, very dangerous considering they just hopped right in front of Ali, however, able to take down Dinosuke as well. Looking great for St. John's, this is just the reinforcements they need as Rabbit sends herself off the edge. 
just like that, they should be able to regroup, so it's not looking too bad for Yukon as well. They just have to wait for everyone to regroup to try to push again, especially with that rally from Ali that's going to be running in just a few seconds. That's going to be really strong, but in the meantime, St. John's is going to hold this very, very close. They want to take the advantage, and they do have the old economy to do so. It's going to be the Zarya going in, committing the grab, locking everybody up into that high ground. And now with the Reinhardt getting the nano boost, it's going to be the opportunity for St. John's to continue to push ahead, investing a few ults, but they managed to hold. But even when they invest this ultimate abilities, they still have a bunch to use because, like I mentioned, they didn't use into those first fights. They decided to save them, and now these are already with 50% for a blade again. Their ultimate economy is looking really good. They need to make sure that they don't let the side of Econ take the advantage here with what they have, especially with a tactical visor. False bomb tries to go out from Q, doesn't land on too much. And now it's going to be the Valkyrie coming in from Yukon as well as the Rally. But the big Earth Shatter opens things up for St. John's. The question is, will the follow up be there? Then Techie taken down, but is Rez back up? Now it's going to be Yukon's opportunity to drop the Gravitic Flux. Zabarier coming out from Liam does keep the entirety of St. John's alive so far. Rich trying to contest the high ground, but Ben Techie just does have the better aim with that tack visor going online. It's not going to be Yukon who have the opportunity to take the point here. It looks like they're just trying to shore up the last few kills. They're trying to get a percentage, but Lucy's going to put up a fight, gets taken down immediately with that headshot from Enka. That should be enough. That should be the cleanup that Yukon was needed. Took them a little bit longer, but the Sangers will come through now. The Sipas are going in with the blade once again, trying to find the brig. Doesn't have success as much as they did last time. And be brought down with the melee from Q. Who now looking to change their uh, focus onto the supports. It's gonna be Yukon holding down Mecha base here for the first submap of Busan. And it was just very interesting to see Bizarre going for the break. You know, you're gonna get stunned and not get as much value as you would want to do. So a few seconds that are so important to try to get value out of a blade especially when you don't have the nano to help you out stay alive or a rally even so that's where we start seeing a few other differences of the picks that both teams decide to go with but this blade that we see on this high that has been really good it was what were enables and johns to get the point for at least just a few seconds and they seem to be quite enough now you want to see the comeback from them they're looking really really strong but they just have to have the first initiation to take the advantage We'll see if they'll be able to get that advantage here as now the doors are about ready to drop onto Sanctuary. Once again, St. John's needs to win the next two submaps in order to take Busan into victory. We'll see if Ventec can find that advantage here with the soldier, that high ground. Not as dominant as it might be on a mecha base, but it still is in existence. However, not to contest with Bizarre this time around and Rich on the Ash. So a little bit of the double hit scan, a lock coming through from St. John's. Well, we see the Roadhog trying to get the damage in, trying to put pressure on the shields. Turns it to that towards the Tracer, makes her back off for just a moment. See the hooks trying to come through, not going to land onto a Brig shield, unfortunately. And Bizarre is the first one to land any sort of kills. And now St. John's are starting to lead in the advantage here as we see them trying to get onto that Mercy. Rich gets caught out by Ben Teki, gets the double kill. See St. John's again, not quite capturing this point just yet. The Yukon still trying to put up fights. They're gonna have to start sending their softer characters onto the point, however. Although Ben Techie's still looking like a force to be reckoned with. Not gonna be able to reckon with those tanks, however. Was able to get four, but it doesn't seem like it was just quite enough. Now he has to wait for the team to regroup and try to push again, but the ultimates are slowly building up. And the biggest difference for St. John's is that tank line composition where there's Roar who is playing some main tank. The kills keep coming through. We see that Yukon doesn't want to give up yet. They certainly do not, and they're already getting on to the point. The contest finally coming through from Squiggle. As we can see, the Pulse of Mine going out doesn't land on anything. Q might be wanting that one back. Either way, Mr. Swallowman going to be trying to throw in some Zarya damage here. Has the grab, decides not to use it for this fight, at least not yet. As now St. John's continues to lean in, and Yukon might be a little bit on the retreat here. And the confidence is definitely going for the side of St. John's, starting to build up slowly just because of that nano going through. We do so that the Sari is going to be having that Graviton search to use at any point very early on. If you're able to take the advantage because of that, you might just get to the 70%, which is the ideal situation for this point that gives you the confidence that you can win. And the biggest opportunity for Yukon is going to be the Tactical Vicer coming through. See the Gravitic Flux coming online from Mitben. Not able to find a whole lot of damage, but the follow up is sure enough there. It's going to be a lot of members from the side of St. John's falling. Although they held it to 65, that's about where it stops. It will start getting presented for themselves. It will be looking pretty good as well. But 
Also, looking at Xinjiang is going to be very risky. They might just throw Bob into pointing. That's just going to put a lot of pressure into the support item to try to stay alive, to try to make sure they don't get picked. When you have this Mercy and the Senyata, it just might not be enough heals for the damage that Bob might have. And especially knowing that on the other side, we can have Bizarre on the flank. You see Rich sending Bob in on to the point. It's going to cause a little bit of a distraction to come through, but... It's on to St. John's to try to take advantage of it. And so far, not a lot of St. John's rushing the point to really help out Bob. Venteki does drop the attack visor, trying to do the damage, while the Transcendence from Ali keeps everybody on their team alive. We're now looking towards St. John's to try to make some sort of recovery, especially as Mr. Koala Man gets that nano boost, but it all seems a four not so far as St. John's not quite capable of striking back. At least I say that until Bizarre drops a t double kill on the attack visor of their own one of those including themselves he does get taken out at the end and the percentage is looking pretty even so far seems like university are connected to connected so he's gonna be able to push the advantage especially with the sparks you see the flux come on online but squingle gonna so far survive the majority of that thanks to the projected barrier from koala man now looks like st john's setting up for another opportunity here not a lot of ults in favor of either side so st john's might have the advantage considering they did just get the elimination on to q bizarre wrapping around on the side drum trying to find out that mercy can't quite land the shots instead directs their focus towards that zenyatta removing the discord orb from the fight certainly going to help they have the backup of rich and with that they net the value sigma soon to follow after although the res did come through it didn't mean a whole lot to the side of yukon they're going to try to fight this point try to stay here but it doesn't seem like there's going to be enough they might just lose it now and we do see 666 that for the side of Saint they start getting this could be one last fight territory though it's to start getting taken down then that would be the best opportunity that they have but for the side of the yukon in those last few seconds that we still they were able to build those support ultimates are so important here the pile driver coming in from rabbit as an initiation tool but rabbit takes quite a bit of damage the transcendence comes out in response to the graviton surge mr koala man not able to achieve much but does eventually lose a ben Pecky in the end as rich as that pulse bump although down to the once again dropping the res on to the soldier can't say i blame it given the performance we've seen from that player and now it looks like the yukon are well on their way to getting that 100 percent it's all a matter of time before it ticks down that's gonna be it yukon takes busan and no one was able to touch at the end very unfortunate situation if you're on the side of 10 jumps but it was very very close we can recognize that and uh it, yeah even though they do win this 2-0 so far they still once again have the opportunity on the other maps and they do have the understanding even though genji was a very risky play that we could recognize i think i do want to see i want to keep seeing this because it does have the potential to give more value for the future matches uh, certainly the opportunity for a lot of value here i liked some of the plays we did see coming through from both sides yukon just looking a lot more determined a lot more dedicated uh, not dedicated but a lot more proficient than saint john's sometimes that's just the way it goes saint john's gonna need to tighten up a little bit on the plus side that was control which you know, sometimes a little bit more of an equalizing factor so saint john's definitely has an opportunity as we go into the more objective based modes yeah, and again, it was it was looking very, very close for them once they were able to take control of the point. They knew how to hold it a little bit better, but they were struggling and just figuring out a way to try to take it when they didn't have it. And especially because Yukon was the one taking the advantage, was the one pushing forward right at the beginning of the maps and making sure they were able to get that initial percentage that sometimes can be so, so important, even when the fight hasn't even been won yet. So that's one of the key factors why we can see them. But overall, the compositions are looking a little bit different up uh, for the side of St. John's. They were playing the Roadhog and they were also playing the Saria, which is really, really good. But it just forces the Roadhog to make sure he's hurting enough space for the team, even when you have the point in your control. So if we're going to be seeing this Roadhog again, because you recognize he's a very strong hero and has a one-shot potential, it has to be creating more space for the team. Yeah, you definitely need to be getting some aggression with that Roadhog. You trade that shielding capabilities for the damage that the Zarya and Roadhog can put down as well. Like I mentioned a little bit, Roadhog good at protecting against those flanks, which kind of puts the Roadhog in a tough spot. Do you protect the flanks and kind of keep an eye towards your back, or do you keep pressing forward ahead, finding that location where you can optimize your space? A question that I think St. John's is going to have to toy around with a bit more. 
Yeah, definitely, because that also puts, depending on what the support of the lineup looks like, you usually have to peel at least for each other to make sure everyone stays alive. So this is why we might see uh, teams not really opting for playing this role, but playing those safety heroes that they know they will be able to protect, maybe a D.Va, maybe a Sigma, where you can also just keep an eye on everyone while, without really having to play too aggressive to make sure you're getting value and you're getting the point. However, before we move on, St. John's going to be needing to do some sub outs as well. So we will be taking a brief little break here, folks. Stay tuned. Can St. John's adapt? You'll have to find out after the break. Welcome back, friends, one and all, as we are heading into Blizzard World, UConn versus St. John's. It's going to be University of Connecticut up 1-0 here off the back of Busan. Sir Waltham and Dryad at it again. Dryad, we're now looking at Blizzard World. What do we expect? We already see a little bit of the picks that we're going to be seeing on the side for UConn on this defense. They're going to be playing this Wrecking Ball, this Sigma, which is a little bit more of the meta that we're expecting teams to be playing. But they're also playing those two hitkins that Soldier 76 along with Ash is going to be very, very interesting to see how much value they can get of this too, because it's not the expected composition. We usually expect one of the hitkins if we're going to be seeing two. It's usually going to be the Widowmaker, maybe, along with the Ash. But this is a very unique um, DPS lineup. And in the meantime, for the side of and Jones, they have the same idea of playing their Roadhog and Sarah, which you think they can get value out of, but they need to make sure that you're taking this high ground and getting close to the enemy. Ooh, and they can take the high ground all they want, but losing Bizarre is gonna hurt either way. St. John's now gonna have to be very aggressive to push in without that Hanzo. We see Mr. Koala Man trying to get a hold of that Wrecking Ball does find it, but looks like we're gonna be taking a brief pause. Even the game is gonna need a moment to struggle to understand what just happened there. <laughs> Now, uh, hopefully no disconnects. You always hate to see that ultimate drop back down to zero. Yeah, and um, we're going to see what happened with that first pick. Uh, the, we saw them getting into the hands is ideal. They were pushing forward, and I did like the strategy of just trying to take the high ground because that's how you know you can take advantage with the Roadhog and Saria. But after that, uh, you do have to have the six members, so it's not going to get any value. So it's a very, very risky situation. But now we can keep going with the gameplay. Now certainly now going to be leaning back into it. St. John's having the opportunity here. It looks like not a whole lot of drops, just perhaps a momentary pause for connections. Uh, Rich going to be taking down Tino Suki, meaning that there's not going to be any res available for the defending team. St. John's going to be looking to lean into this. At least they would if Ben Techie didn't take down that Lucio. The lack of speed might hamper St. John's just a little bit. And right now they really need to get a grip onto Ben Techie because it just looks like that soldier's running a rough shot. Eventually Rich does find the capitalization, but all right, might be a little bit too late. Now it's the tanks that St. John's has to deal with. The question is, will they be able to? They're both pushing up onto this Sigma, really trying to get the damage on to Mitt Bano. Doesn't look like they're falling too immediately. It will, however, eventually go the way of Yukon. 
Fantastic. He's just doing pretty much whatever he wants on this soldier, and he's getting so much rally. Yeah, he does get taken out at the end. That that's putting a lot of pressure into St. John's University, who still have to figure out how they want to engage here. They do have the right idea, though. Taking the high ground would be the best situation for them, and especially with a whole hog. But they need to get closer with Yukon. We see Yukon still maintaining this high ground position, a dominant spot given the early picks that Q got in the last fight. And now they notice that this soldier is located all off by himself, Gulpin. And to be able to get regrouped with their team relatively easy, however, Mr. Koala Man going in for the hook, but gets punished for it, not able to defend themselves, not able to take a breather because of that they just get burned down. But so does a rabbit, meaning that those mines are not going to be on the field immediately. At least that is until the res from Dinozuki comes in to keep the player back alive. As we look now, St. John's struggling to get ahead here. They're looking to fight for every square inch of this map that they can. You see Bizarre trying to use the sonar arrows to discover anybody that they can take advantage of, but Yukon's not really keen to let that happen just yet, Dryad. He can with the six ultimate abilities. That's definitely intimidating for the side of St. John's. They're going to start using them, taking the advantage, getting PK picks for themselves. It looks like the Gravitic Flux doesn't find a whole lot of rich catching the grab onto the barrier for the uh, Sigma, but it's going to be Rabbit who drops the minefields, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, gets two with it, and looks like that's going to be just enough for Yukon to stabilize here. Ventec, you turn that corner, whipping the rockets into Slurpee. And a lot of ultimates that had to be used for the set of Yukon, we were talking about how they had six, and now, well, they had to use five of them, but look at Midben already with 76% for getting that flux again, so they're looking really, really good. Only one minute remaining for St. John's to make something happen in this attack, and it's not looking too good without the grab. It's so really not looking too great at all. They do have the nano coming through, but yeah, ideally would have liked to save that grab for Bizarre to combo with. However, as they look ahead, the only thing we'll have to deal with from the enemy team is gonna be that Valkyrie, so keep an eye out for that. Q, once again, taking down Bizarre. Bizarre seems to get caught in these weird rotations or in the rotations that St. John's are just not able to protect them in. Now it's gonna be both DPS taken down. In an uncomfortable spot as they have to push ahead, try to get to point, but Yukon still has those man advantage numbers as now they're looking to try to lean in here. We do see Bizarre now trying to regroup with their team. Is the Hanzo so they can play from a little bit farther back, but now it's gonna be Slurpee who drops. And no nano available for the side of St. John's. Looks like the numbers are all but done bleeding out. And with that, not really a lot that can touch point. And because of that, St. John's doesn't make Nary a tick. And another full hold that we see. Yukon doing really good on the defense. The ultimate economy looking pretty good. Even when they invested a lot, they knew that how to play slow, how to make sure that they were not getting picked right at the beginning. That's what made the whole difference. They are doing so, so good over and over again. And once again, there are a few times where St. John's was trying to, it seemed like it was they were going to take the advantage and they were getting some initial picks, but they weren't able to capitalize out of them. So that was really, really affecting them. They have a big challenge here and trying to hold a defense. I'm not sure if not having a shield is going to be enough because Saria has done an amazing job making sure everyone gets taken down really fast. But when you are defending, you're not going to, having, to, to be having that energy that you want to get. It's going to be a very tough position here, but St. John's are probably going to be leaning in to the defense, uh, to the stationary defense a little bit heavily. We see Bazaar coming out with the Torbjorn. And yeah, it looks like they're actually going to be walking through the choke. So this isn't just a stay and spawn and fool the casters type situation. Yeah, we already see the picks that they're going for and that Roadhog and Sigma are looking pretty good. I do like seeing the Sigma like we were talking definitely better than this area for this defense. But it, again, it's not going to be easy. You do have Bissar on the Torbjorn and that just means that you need to make sure you're staying alive that the turret is getting value and that's a lot of pressure, especially when we look at that 1v1 between Gulpin and also for the, the soldier on the other side, the soldier 1v1 was making the entire difference. Where Whoever gets the ultimate first is going to take the advantage. And be very careful here if you're St. John's. You have to try to put some pressure on but without feeding your lines of sight over to those widows, to those ashes. And immediately, it's going to be Mr. Koala Man taken a down by the ash. This time, the dynamite, though, not the giant rifle firing those massive slugs. As we look, Gulpin on this high ground, trying to throw down a little bit of threat towards the DPS of the attacking team, but Yukon not seeming too bothered by it, does eventually take down the turret of Bizarre, meaning that now St. John's in a more vulnerable position. Rich actually getting the breather interrupted, able to walk away. 
to a relative safety, at least waiting for their breather to build back up. Does have an amazing amount of stall coming through from that tank player. It's gonna be the anti-nade on to mid then. He does eventually end up falling, and St. John's so far looking like they're doing a great job of holding. It's just gonna be dealing with a rabbit on this wrecking ball. Eventually she's dealt with, but Q might have just put the nail in the coffin. Even if the team doesn't win this fight, St. John's is now at a very great loss for members. Yukon can get regrouped, they have an advantage here. And they were taking a little bit too long into the pride when they know they have to recruit really early on. But now they do have the open economy throwing Bob into point. Might just put enough pressure for St. John's to fall down. That's exactly what they want here. And especially before the transcendence is built. Uh, and Yukon gonna be dropping or is gonna be losing Ali early on into that gulpin from on high trying to put a little bit of damage with the attack visor, but it just sinks right onto Bob, not able to do a whole lot of damage with that. Now Yukon starting to swarm the point with these multiple long lines of sight. It's gonna be the Roadhog from Rich being the last opportunity of hope here, but gets knocked out of the way by the Wrecking Ball. The Ana now has to tag in, sleeps a rabbit, but there's only so much you can do when you're facing down the rest of the team. And with that, it's gonna be University of Connecticut take their second point. Yukon coming up on top, doing really, really good on the attacking, on defense as well, like we mentioned. I think the biggest highlight would definitely be the defense, where they were always getting those initial picks from the beginning, when they were able to take Vissar down on the hand. So that just put a, definitely a statement that they were going to be the dominant team here, and we are definitely seeing this from them. They're like, oh, this is match point. Uh, this is a very good spot for UConn. We were talking about these teams needing to kind of separate their score lines, right? They're they're tied at that one and three. And it looks like UConn's looking to make that a two and three. And St. John's might just have to take a knee on this one, but you always do it in the hopes of finding that tape, getting the reviews in, improving your skills for the next time. But St. John's, they're not quite out of it just yet. There is an opportunity for the recovery. Yeah, there definitely is, and um, for the defense, it actually lasted a little bit longer, so they had some opportunities to do so, but it just became very, very impossible when not everyone was together. The soldier got taken down, then everyone else when you don't have the supports as well. So at this point, if you're St. John's, you want to play into the comfort picks that you have, rather than to counter, maybe they're playing something that they believe was at some point meta, which definitely was, um, but not being able to get as much value as you would want to would definitely be a sign to try something else. Maybe you can get value if you want to see a dive, you want to see maybe a brawl again, or if they want to come up with something completely different, this is a big opportunity to do so. Certainly it is. St. John's going to need to put the brakes on for UConn's momentum to be halted at all here because they're certainly looking at very clean so far. As we now look to head into our next map, it's going to be Hanamura. And I don't know, it, you have to be a little bit hopeful for St. John's, but even when we've seen good performances on Hanamura, it doesn't quite deliver just enough. Yeah, and it just comes to the same subject that we mentioned over and over again. First of all, it's what composition they're going to run for the attack, especially because that's going to make the difference into how you want to deal with the choke that is so hard to pass through. And once you get that, then... For the defense, how you're able to hold into second point. The high ground is a very good strategy, but usually when you see Wrecking Balls, we see Divas, we see everyone else being very, very disruptive and pushing everyone down. So the moment that the attacking uh, gets that first initiation, gets a high ground, it's pretty much over for the defenders. It's going to be so much harder for them to try to do anything to get as much value as they would want to. And we're already seeing Yukon is going to start here on the defense. They are playing the Sigma and the Roadhog, so watch out opportunity one shot potential for them to come through as well from this hero am i misremembering i thought rich was on the dps roll a little bit earlier i'm gonna be seeing them on the zarya right now either way however immediately walking head first into ben Techie's turret gonna be taking quite a bit of damage there although they are able to get it healed back up that's gonna feed their supports a little bit of old charge but gonna feed a yukon a little bit of old charge on their dps as well and then tries to go for the hook, knowing that that Ryan shield is dangerously low. Doesn't quite land onto it. It's going to be the McCree. Tries to stun out that Roadhog, but you can't fan the hammer into a giant body like that. Now Yukon has the advantage. They're going to be pressing on towards St. John's, who are going to be taking this upward rotation, Dryad. They will be taking the hangman, but I don't know how much value they can get out of it, knowing that they lost a few members. It's not going to be easy. And now Yukon already knows what they're doing. They're going to prepare for it. But on the other side, Ash is going to try to get a few picks. Q has had a really good performance, and Banka already coming up on top. Is that pick into the Lucio? 
And Q gonna be maintaining those spawns, making sure that nobody can get back to point. Rich on this high ground, taking a little bit of a nap. It's the shield that's gonna go up and a big pin onto the Roadhog. Midven taking it down early. St. John's has at least one opening here, but they have to be careful not to let Dino get the res even better if they can get the kill onto Dino. Does look like the res is gonna come through, but no kills onto the Mercy either. St. John's now finally making their way towards this point after a minute and a half. It's gonna be the Coalescence that enables them to just get a little bit more reinforcement, but they have to be very careful as that Reinhardt receives an anti nade can't get healed, and because of that, eventually drops to a Rabbit. You see Gopin up on that high ground, trying to maintain that long out of arms rank length damage. St. John's does deliver a few of the kills. It's gonna be mid -Ben as well. Trying to just hold down Venteki, trying to play with that Torbjorn, but eventually it does fall. Gopin trying to lock it down, can't sink the shots into the Zarya. Doesn't matter, that point is still getting some progress. Everyone from the side of Econ at the end is trying to stay in point, trying to wait for a little bit longer, but it didn't seem like it was enough. They needed more time. It's not looking too bad for them, but yeah, there is a lot of time still remaining for St. John's to get to the second point, but they might not have the biggest advantage. Go and actually it does get the back into Q. A good opening there as now Dino Suki not going to be having that res up for the next fight. Yukon gonna be waiting this out, taking it as slow as possible so they can get that cool down back. Gonna be keep throwing in some dynamite, trying to get some of that big blast damage, and the Earth Shatter comes in, but it's halted by the Gravitic Flux. It's gonna have to be Mr. Koala Man keeping the shield up as much as possible so they don't lose too much health, lose too much life, or their entire life, I suppose. As now Yukon trying to maintain with Q's sight lines on high. There's not a lot that can deal with them from the side of St. John's Gulpin. They have to really try to find those shots, but they need to clear off this high ground in the first condition. As now they start to back up and retreat. They don't want to take this fight any more than they already have. It's going to be a for just a few seconds that Rohit gets a pick into the loser, so now you definitely you're not going to have speed or enough heals like you would want to have from the side of St. John's. But a lot of ultimates that will be coming through if you're able to combine the Graviton Surge along with the Death Blossom that might just get the initial picks to push forward into the point. So this would be ideal winning condition for St. John's. On the other side, Yukon does have a big chance here as well. Q has done an amazing job so far in this Ash. And we'll still have that Bob in for next fight. Let me throw on it right onto the high ground with them. Bob taking the twin shots. Meaning that Q has a little bit of that reinforcement. It's going to be helping to seal off the high ground from St. John's. It does eventually go spawn side to try and get some sort of damage and try to get some rotations in. But now we're seeing the Nano Boost go onto the Roadhog. That Roadhog going to be able to deal a lot of damage with the boosted shotguns coming through. It's going to be onto this course. Try to keep Mr. Koala Man alive and bizarre. Coming in with the Reaper drops, the Death Blossom finds the Torbjorn, but gets hooked for their efforts. Mitven going to be able to take down a one, make it two with the whole hug. Golpin finds the final shot onto that Roadhog. So close to getting one tick up and online. It's now going to be the May coming out. Q not able to stall at the headshot. Drills that May into the ground. Now trying to find the Ana Golpin. Not quite able to land onto the hitbox of the elderly grandma. We're seeing some different tanks come out from Yukon trying to get on Mitven onto that Winston to deal with the Widowmaker. First tick has already been given up. We are seeing the grab come out from St. John's trying to lock everybody down, but Q on this main does hold on to the point, stalls out for just a little bit longer. 50% and upwards ticking for St. John's Dryad. And they are going to get this point. They still have a little time remaining, so they're looking pretty good for San Jones. This is a very similar scenario to what we saw before. Some teams are just very good at attacking. And for St. Jones, it definitely took them a little bit longer, but they're happy they're able to get this two points. Now, the biggest challenge, once again, is going to be seeing Yukon, how they're going to engage, what composition they're going to run. Once St. John was able to get a few picks, they knew that was the momentum that they needed to get first and second point and lasting a little bit longer than expected but once again as long as you can get them that just might be enough if they want to take the advantage in this map as we can see that reaper going in for the death blossom but mitman not gonna allow them to finish it overall that was a very well played opportunity there from saint john's i like the posting of that widowmaker up onto the high ground it makes it so much harder to deal with when you have to have somebody on point otherwise it gets capped I mean, we saw UConn try to go in with that Winston. It only cost them a little bit of tank presence on the point, and they just weren't able to hold from there.
And I was a little bit hesitant about seeing Golfing on the Widowmaker, but he definitely came through getting those picks and doing really, really good. And it was just because the positioning didn't seem to be really benefiting him, knowing that everyone was countering this Widowmaker. Everyone, the, the shields were available, everyone was hiding from that choke. But after that four second point, he definitely came up on top, getting those kills, always making sure he was able to get value of this hero, of this character, doing really good. So if you're going to see a Widowmaker, this would be a perfect opportunity to do so again. Absolutely. And this is exactly what St. John's needed. If you look at the scoreboard, we have to remind you, this is final point for UConn to take away with the victory in this matchup. So St. John's needs to start putting some points on their board to at least turn that map differential into their favor, at least a little bit more. And the way that we saw them already perform is a really good sign that they might be able to do so. But again, there's a lot of pressure into the defense, how they want to do it. For the side of UConn, they feel very comfortable into the compositions they've played so far. But for the side of the defense, we can already see the compositions that they're going to be running. Gulpin is actually going from a hitscan hero to a jump crowd. So that should put a lot of damage, a lot of pressure into the shields that UConn is going to bring. There's the goods and bads of this Junkrat. You're going to be feeling a lot of pressure if you're Rabbit's Shield, but Mitben going to be at a pretty high damage charge given how much splash those grenades can do. Even one or two will fully charge Azaria's personal or uh, projected barrier. As we see, St. John's now trying to feed in some of those pills by Gulpin. Just carefully peeking these angles. Going to be slowly working their way up. And as we can see already, you are going to be pushing through, but Ventec. Techie taken down early on with the concussion mine thrown out from the Junkrat. Excellent play from St. John's as they continue to hold this point for their first push. And the damage that we were talking about, definitely something that we can notice now. With especially with this Junkrat already 51 to get the ultimate ability that's so so important at this point. We've seen some amazing plays coming through, and this might be a big opportunity to do so. They have to keep pushing the damage. There you go. And this Junkrat is not letting them sleep. If Yukon is at the choke, they're almost certainly going to get hit with a pill. And Gulpin now looking to press here as they are so close with that tire. They're going to be letting that soldier run away, not too bothered by it, considering it's just more time bought off the clock. Yeah, definitely. So another time for this side of Econ to regroup to figure out what they want to do. And there's a big opportunity. Vente trying to take the high ground here, trying to get a few picks, but everyone's looking at him. So that just puts more pressure. They have to figure out a way for the choke. Oh no, it's Ryan versus Ryan. And it's Mr. Koala Man coming out superior. Gulpin sure didn't help the problem with throwing in all those bombs and concussion mines. The double kill with the Earth Shatter. There's a lot to unpack in those two seconds. Three kills immediately for Gulping with the damage only because the ultimate ability hasn't been used just yet. And also that Shatter getting two more. Really, really good job. They are definitely struggling for the side of Yukon to push here. We do see Ben Tech going on to the Farah. A risky maneuver considering how dominant that rocket or that turret can be at taking down those sky units. It's going to be Yukon who are now looking a little bit weaker and they can't quite figure out how to pierce this choke. Two minutes remaining for the side of Yukon to try to figure out something out. They still don't have the ultimate abilities that they want to have. Maybe that Dead Bellsman can help them out so much. They've definitely made the changes necessary, but they have to get the ultimates fast. And especially knowing that Jose and Jensen are looking pretty comfortable on the truck, they don't let anyone pass. One of these days, Yukon is going to learn that you can't just peek that choke with a Gulpin. It doesn't seem like today is that day. However, Gulpin still has that tire. Just holding on to it until at least Yukon seems a little bit more committed, but they can't really get committed when they continue to have this man disadvantage of 5v6, 4v6, just because they keep walking into the errant pipe bomb. And I'm just curious to see how much damage Gulpin has done so far. Absolutely amazing performance from the DPS. They don't even feel the need to use the ultimate in 1 minute and 10 seconds remaining for you can. This is when they have the ultimate abilities. If they're not able to get value out of it now, it's going to be really hard at the end. Oh, and a huge opening was there for Benteki. They weren't quite able to get the finishing damage onto Gulpin. The grab goes out with the Molten Core trying to deal increased damage. Not quite able to find it, however, Yukon. Finally has the opening, but here comes the tire from Gulpin. Can they deliver? Goes right onto the Ana. No more healing available for the side of Yukon. Save that Lucio. The question is, how long will it last? Rabbit taking quite a bit of damage. The Earth Shatter does come out to help secure at this point. Venteki back on with the Farah, ready to throw down. Does deliver with a couple of rockets to Gulpin to sure up this case. 
and Techie able to come up just in time to make sure to finish this this one as well. Especially taking into account that, like you mentioned, Anna was taken down right at the beginning by Goldfin, so that put more pressure into them. That they won't have as much time they need to make sure they get value out of this now. That Barash at Dead Blossom are going to put a lot of damage coming from for the side of Yukon, but it has to happen early on. They use every single ultimate ability to make sure they could get first point. Now they have to figure out a way into getting the high ground here. Excellent use of those rockets coming in from Bizarre to get themselves on that high ground. However, St. John's needs to be careful as they will be getting some point progress from the side of Yukon. If they're not careful, the Earth, the Death Blossom coming out, Earth Shadow from Mr. Koala Man to interrupt, succeeds in taking down the Reaper, the Mercy soon to follow. And with this, St. John's continues their hold and they might start to have a better looking time bank. Really good cleanup from the side of St. John's again. They have a really good preparation for this map, and it definitely shows. Now, Rich is going to have that garbage search if you use, and they can combine it with anything that they want. Yukon is investing a lot of ultimates and not really getting as much value as they would want to. We can see, once again, Ben does have the barrage, but it's not going to be easy to get value out of it, especially with the shield. You need to figure out a way around it. Maybe when no one's looking that far on the flank might be the solution for them. And Bizarre's gonna have to be very careful with Venteki being such a valuable player here. They're gonna be target number one. I see Venteki looking to creep around. It's gonna be the grab going out. Doesn't land on the two much, but Rich jumping from on high trying to deal with the Farah ends up finding it with the help of Gulpin. Now St. John's continuing to hold. Gonna try to be punishing this uh, wrecking ball, but the Beno gonna be able to get away at least for the time being with a little bit of help. Over and over again, the ultimate economy for St. John's is just looking ideal. They invest about two ultimates, but they are able to get two more throughout the fight. Now, Gopin, like you mentioned, is going to now have that ultimate to be used, and that's going to be so, so strong here. There's not a lot of space to work with, and Egan has to make something happen. One minute, 20 seconds remaining for them. Not many ultimates. Once again, that nano might not be enough. Aside from that junker, not a lot of opportunity for the instant picks. Rabbit does receive the nano boost, but gets trapped. An excellent trap placement. Gulpin buying a lot of time off the nano boost from a rabbit, meaning they can't build up that primal as quickly. Rabbit getting burned down because of it doesn't have the damage resistance anymore. Now the tires leaning in, takes out the Ino, uh, the Ana Dino Suki. Now not going to be able to keep their team alive. Both honest now taken out of the fight, but I place the wager that the defensive one's going to get back in a little bit quicker. We see Venteki trying to stay on the high ground, but somebody's going to need to get the point if they want to start converting any of that point progress. Venteki is going to get the exit kill, get away, and regroup. And we were talking about the dominance that Yukon had before, but now it's definitely not looking like it. They have to, they know they don't have much time, 30 seconds remaining, they're going to start with, with the minefield. A great opportunity here as Rabbit goes down, and no more Winston, and none of that primal rage to have to deal with. Bizarre has the attack visor from the high ground, going to be dropping it in. It goes and takes out Venteki, who also drops the attack visor. An excellent play coming in from St. John's, who really has the leg up in this fight. 15 seconds remain, any exit kills they can get are going to be great. Only getting the pick into the soldier, but not everyone is going to be able to regroup on time, which is the last thing that you want here in Hanamura. You want everyone to push forward. A lot of ultimates that were invested there, and doesn't seem like it's going to be enough. Someone has to touch her, it's going to be the Reaper. It is going to be the Reaper. Liam going to be dropping that amplification matrix, burning down Rabbit. Rabbit having such a hard time getting and staying on to point. Q now just trying to slowly build up that Death Blossom, drop it right onto the supports right onto the point if possible. Q realizing that that auto is just going to back up, stay within the relative safety. Now it's looking so good for St. John's to start their resurgence. The sleep dart goes out from Dinosuke, not able to find much. And with that, it's going to ensure St. John's comes back on Hanamura. St. John's making the comeback that we were talking about. They're doing really good here in Hanamura. This means that it's not going to be a 3-0. We're going to have map four where anything could happen. Maybe St. John's just, need, just needed that initial preparation. We're definitely seeing them being very, very strong. Whatever map it is, I just want to see Gulpin once again on that Junkra. That was honestly fantastic to watch. Gulpin, not necessarily playing Junkrat to a huge mechanical degree, but knew how to manipulate that choke point in the way that every junk rat should. Just fire pills, they're big enough, they'll hit something, they'll deal damage, you'll build a tire. That's all. And this is something that you would expect other teams to know how to counter, you know 
uh, how to take down this young cat, but the positioning was also really good from his team. Everyone was playing forward. He was protected by everyone else, by the main tanks, and also, of course, the supports making sure he was staying alive through the damage. And it happened over and over again. I, I believe that for the side of Yukon, they had the opportunity to try to make the comeback and to have more time, if not so much time was invested into getting pegged by this drone crowd over and over again. Certainly seems to be the case, but time is not quite upon us just yet. Yukon now leading two to one over St. John. St. John still has a little bit of a road to go, but we'll be finding exactly how they take that road after this brief break. Welcome back, folks. And if you were expecting this one to end in a quick 3-0, well, already you're sorely disappointed. It's going to be St. John's taking their victory at Hanamura. So far, meaning it is now a 2-1, to one, but St. John's not quite out of the mud just yet. They still have to climb back as we head into our next map, which is going to be Havana. Yeah, and a really, really good map to try to define this to see if Yukon is going to try to get a 3-1 or if maybe St. John is actually trying to make that comeback, that reverse sweep might be on its way. So I really, really want to see this. I, I already said it, I just want to see more aggression from this team when they were able to get so much damage coming through with the Junkrat, they were able to capitalize. And okay, fine, maybe Junkrat is not the best pick for this map, but I would just say go for it. I mean, if you have the momentum going, maybe you can get something out of it. Yeah, I mean... Certainly have to think so, but I mean, you know, we look at Havana, it's going to be a little bit different from what we saw on Hanamura, so you can't quite utilize the geometry as much as you'd like, although one thing I'll give a little bit of credit for, Gulpin likes playing that Widowmaker, there are points on Havana where, or on Havana where Widowmaker cannot play a little bit. Yeah, and um, seeing this double sniper is very well known to see on this map. And we've talked about how the composition changes a little bit uh, and how there's the different opportunities that you have to pick. We see a lot of divals coming through here, but from what teams are showing us for the side of the defense, at least, and UConn, we're going to be seeing on the Sigma being played out, having that protection, having uh, just that shield that's going to allow for that up angle is going to be really, really good for this team. And we also are seeing Rabbit once again, she's going to be playing into that Wrecking Ball, just trying to create a little bit more space, knowing that they have the advantage if they have control of the high ground. You know, already see Q trying to get in a few scrappy shots. It's going to be Double Sniper versus Double Sniper. Q holding those sight lines towards main and towards that alleyway, ensuring that there's not a huge amount of rotation that can come through. But St. John's already claiming some nice kills. Gulpin getting the kill onto Ben Techie. You know, that Mercy has to commit that res. And when you have such pick potential as the snipers from these teams, it's something you'd rather not lose early on into these fights. You see St. John sending Mr. Koala Man up top with the Winston to try to cause a little bit of disruption. Will be the Discord Orb going on to them, making them a little bit more of a vulnerable target. Now St. John's has to expend their res just to keep the Ana in the game, keep those tanks healed up as much as possible. And St. John's sputtering out just a little bit, not getting much cart progress either. 
They're going to be playing this very, very slowly. They don't want to get picked right at the beginning. And this is a very smart strategy that we can see from them. Which gets another pick into Ali. Not having one of the supports is very, very bad for your team. But also, you can have the rest if it's able to come through. But it's in a really bad spot. Yukon going to be taking a loss in Q. Now, we do see the dragons coming out from Benteki. But it's going to buy actually a little bit of time for the res to come through onto Mr. Koala, man. So, res is coming through for both sides. And going to be those tanks getting very aggressive here. This is what I wanted to see from St. John's, but perhaps a bit too much aggression as Ben Teki catches both the Winston and the Widow as a grudge against characters with W in their name, apparently, as now Yukon continuing to stabilize just a little bit here. They're able to take control once again, and the Hatsunyara able to come back into the fight, just enabling him to have that Discord or being thrown into the tanks, trying to get more value out of it. And so is going to have that primary rage, so like we can see, just pushing everyone all the way back. Ideally, why one here to take control of the high ground again? We well, yeah, do see Mr. Koala Man trying their best to hold up that on high, but Slurpee falls trying to protect them. The grab goes out, doesn't land on the two much. Gonna be mid been taken down, and now the primal coming in for Mr. Koala Man lands smack dab onto the Widowmaker, pummeled into the corner, and a rough spot to be if you're any sort of sniper going up against an angry monkey. Now, as we look, it's gonna be Mr. Koala Man continuing to try to find this benefit, but gets killed on exit. St. John's just needs to regroup. This is looking a little bit sloppy. A lot of action that we're seeing into this fight, but it's not very clear who's going to take the advantage. Of course, it's going to be the defense so far, but they've invested a lot to try to keep the position that they have. Now, the real challenge will be coming through with the ultimate abilities that they have. The Flux will be coming no through very early, early on, nice. and that is going to allow them to try to take advantage, lift someone out, try to put some damage and push forward. They can be putting down the damage. Q gonna have lines of sight to wherever they need to focus that damage for the latest 15 seconds. And Venteki also gonna be taking advantage of that, getting a headshot onto Bizarre. Tries to fire off as the Mercy's getting the res. Doesn't quite seem to connect though, as they do receive that damage boost. Trying to keep themselves in the game, take a couple of shots, but able to get healed up relatively quickly. Mitven taken down now. And again, it seems like St. John's gets the opportunity here, but they don't quite push the advantage. Again, the two kills are coming through. The question is how far will the cart move off those two kills? Rich trying to focus down on the Widow does eventually find it. Now this cart making its way slowly towards that first. Rich just had a really good performance on the star. Yes, so far they will be pushing forward, but the everyone from the set of Yukon might be able to touch just in time, and they want to do so, especially Rabbit does have that mind kill to try to create more space, make sure they can get value out of it. Wait, you can see Bob go right in behind the minefield. The Mercy getting brought dangerously low, gets burned down in the middle of the grab. Midben throwing the Gravitic, the Gravitic Flux to try to lock down the opponents, but not able to find too much. The Transcendence now going to be committed from Ali to very little effect as they do get torn apart as it comes out. It's going to be the first point. Still getting captured and quite a few ultimates invested for no effect from Yukon. Ali doing everything that is possible to try to stay alive and point a little bit longer, and it did go to overtime. But once again, another opportunity to hold here. And this part of the map definitely depends on taking the high gun and taking the advantage. There's a lot of corners going on, and it really depends on trying to hold here because holding in the last part of the map is a little bit more challenging. So I do want to see more aggression being played from the side of St. John's when you have that Wrecking Ball and when you have Rich on the Saria. We're going to be seeing Mr. Koala Man trying to suss out the opposing team, displace them off that high ground if possible. And Hugh this is going to be getting displaced via a headshot set to the grave. So he's going to be able to res them back up for the time being. And Hugh striking back with some righteous anger coming through. Now we do see another res coming in, this time on to the wrecking ball. It's going to be Gulpin with the dragons. We see the graph come out from Azaria, not comboed with the dragons, however. So St. John's not opting for those ultimate combinations as you might like to see. Yukon so far looking very good. They're composing themselves, although they are suffering losses. They're able to maintain their positioning. They're not giving up too much. Now, despite Q going down, it looks like St. John's is still gonna have to be on the back out just a little bit. And a few extra kills coming from the side of McCree on Yukon, allowing them to play a little bit to have more control on the high ground like they would want to you as you know the McCree is able to just stun anyone especially their wrecking ball that can be so disturbing into the high ground now this could be a one last fight territory only 50 seconds remaining for this side of the attacker something has to happen now and he might be just throwing Bob into the payload 
Unfortunately for Bizarre, they do have Bob to get on the payload if Rich and Mr. Koala aren't feeling up to the task. However, Venteki waiting in the wings, has that high noon in pocket. We see the dragons go out, Gulpin throwing it right down the side. Dangerously focusing down Ali. This is a great moment for St. John's. They can continue to push forward. And now with Mr. Koala Man causing a little bit of havoc, causing the next to break of the side of Yukon. It's all a question of can Yukon regroup? It's carts moving closer and closer to the second. They may not. It doesn't seem like they will be able to regroup as much as they would want to. They do have the ultimate economy to benefit them if they're able to get here in time, but it has to happen very early on. We do see that minefield come out from Mr. Koala Man, but the question is, can anybody make it onto Cart Rabbit? Too busy using the whole hog to be able to take a breather. Car is still being contested, but now the kill's coming in from Yukon. Venteki able to take down one. The grab goes out, but nobody there to follow up with it. Bob now from you going to be thrown in just as a little insurance policy. It's the Wrecking Ball trying to stay alive, but St. John's can only do so much. They're so close to that second point, but they're not going to make it. And that was a really, really good job from Yukon. They were able to come back. It wasn't all at once, but one by one, they were able to use their ultimate abilities to take the advantage. And those final kills just happen in a matter of seconds now. St. John's does have the confidence that they can make it through, especially on the defense, but it's not going to be easy. Making sure that you can hold it on the first point would be ideal for them. And it has to happen by creating a lot of space that by controlling a lot of space and the way that we usually see players do this is either with the tanks uh, pushing forward with the wrecking ball with a diva with a winston or also like we already saw from these two teams before having the double smash the double sniper we know that double sniper creates a lot of space it just doesn't really enable a lot of space space for the attackers and that's what i want to see from them but they want to run anything right now where it seems like we're going to bring gulping back on the drum curl that's uh, something that you and I both got to love here at Dryad, a definite favorite of ours so far. Gulpin, we're going to funnel some more of those pills down the lane, but it's going to be a little bit harder here, a wider area to walk through to dodge the, the Junkrat pipe bombs, if you prefer, if you're Yukon, and too many angles that Gulpin may have to keep track of. If they're going to play this composition, I actually would like them to hold it really, really close to the spawn because you know you can have another fight even when you lose it there. And a lot of damage that will be coming through from them. So the fact that they're holding this corner is a little bit more risky when you have Saria, when you have Junkrat, but it could definitely happen. They just have to make sure they don't get picked at the beginning, especially by Q. Advantage of holding this corner, they're going to be able to hold more angles when the cart does eventually make that turn with Bizarre having the turret opportunity to be set up here. Open, continuing to just fire a few pills out of the way. Has to play very carefully as Q now sent long down the range. Trying to find that Ana can't find a whole lot and wisely St. John's backing up, allowing that Widow to not take the aggressive sidelines that they need. And Open taking quite a bit of damage. Q getting trapped up means that there's an opportunity here for St. John's to push up, get aggressive without that mo the mobility coming through for these characters. Q finds the shot onto Slurpee. Benny Techie able to clean up and now Things are looking good for Yukon. They might have the opportunity to lead one foot in front of the other. It's just that Torbjorn trying to hold it steady. Bizar pops the overload, throws out the rivet gun, doesn't find a whole lot. It's just going to be on the Zarya as well as the Torp when the healing comes through to try to get back on the cart and touch. You can will be pushing forward but this payload trying to get more value out of it and they might just get the first point but we know that Regances might be coming through for the side of St. John's 80% for the Garbiton Surge that is going to really clean up the 5 on once again the biggest difference is all by Soldier 76 taking the advantage once again getting those picks and enabling the team to play aggressive. As we see now, Yukon continues to press the advantage. They have five minutes to get through the second phase. And it's gonna be Gulpin trying to get away with that soldier, bobbing and weaving, and Rich providing some good opportunity using that personal barrier, but already Yukon pushing ahead, getting up into the face of their opponents, not giving them a moment to breathe. There's not even anybody on cart at this rate. They're just looking to get these kills. As now the cart slowly making its way towards that box of victory. Playing for picks is one of the strategies that sometimes these players decide to go for. This is definitely one of those cases. Yukon taking the advantage. Ultimate Economy looking really good. About to have all six ultimates to try to win here. They just need one clear fight. But San John is trying to regroup as soon as possible. They're going to also try to use everything that they can, which for the Graviton might be enough. As now Yukon are looking to control this area instead they are going to get control just a little bit as the grab comes out from rich cart continuing to make its way around rich takes down dino tsuki 
that. No more res, no more focused healing coming through in large bursts. But speaking of large bursts of healing, Ali gonna be dropping the Transcendence to try to keep their team up. It's gonna be Bentech, he's throwing in the Tac Visor as well. Dangerously low, however, doesn't have that healing beacon. Just needs to take a little bit of damage, but nobody on St. John's can find that. Cart continues to move, uh, Cart does need to continue to move up. Nobody there. Again, a lot of time being built off for St. John's just by the lack of discipline to be on the cart from Yukon. So Mr. Kalaman does come up with two kills. Can he get more? This is a lot of pressure going through and finally the payload will try to start moving. A lot of changes that we see from the side of St. John's. Rich is going to be playing the D.Va again, trying to get speed. And this is the last chance that they have. And Rich going to be receiving it. Uh, the nano boost to give themselves that little bit more punch and it's gonna work both of the supports have been gutted it's now gonna be on the ben Techie to just be the last kill of this fight and they bought themselves a moment of stay but st john's still on the ropes and a ridiculous amount of time left anyways three minutes for yukon to try to make something happen yeah they did lose that fight in st john's looking pretty good they will be taking the high ground but they still have a few more fights and they just need one to win so big opportunity if they want to initiate with that block that just might be enough really good sleep though a great sleep on to q the focus fire is there both tracers now taken out of the game but so is the lucio for st john's yukon has the opportunity here if they can just lean into it no shields for st john's means they can't mitigate a lot of that damage golpin's gonna find that out the hard way as mitben just finds them with those orbs from Sigma. Yukon is now leading in once again. The self-destruct being forced out from St. John's, but the baby diva's not going to live to see the end of it. As now this cart dangerously close. It's going to have to be the tracer coming in from Bizarre to stall out in any way, shape, or form possible. We do see that tracer getting closer and closer to the pulse bomb, but not able to find it before they die. It's going to have to be onto the Wrecking Ball to find some sort of benefit here, but we've seen Mr. Koala Man do it once before. If anything, they can do it again. The question is, will their team be able to help them? Again, nobody really focusing the cart, and because of that, it's not really making any progress. Yukon continues to throw in, commit the ultimate of the attack visor, but Bizarre gets a double kill. That is so crucial here. If they can just continue on with these kills, they may be able to make things happen. In fact, no, no more respawns. Just gonna be the soldier, and then the Lucio. No sound, no sound barrier, no attack fights to keep themselves alive, but Mr. Koala Man might have different plans. As now we see the Ana trying to keep their one tank alive. Pile driver coming in and not again. St. John's has the response coming in. Venteki taken down. This might be it. They might have an opportunity here. It's going to be the Reaper coming in from Gulpin. Just trying to tuck in right onto that point. Last with those Hellfire shotguns. But Q looking to deliver their own brand of damage with the Pulse Pistols. It's going to help Yukon get to the delivery here. And that's going to be a 3-1 to one victory for Yukon. You can definitely delivering at the end. They struggle a little bit into that second point, but once they figure it out, they were unstoppable, unstoppable, just getting kills over and over again. Then just getting that damage, not only in hands, but in soldiers, especially, they do want to highlight. Really, really amazing performance, enabling the team to play a little bit more aggressive. Once you have the confidence, they get a pick, maybe two, and that's all that they need to take space to make sure that the supports have the confidence that they won't be taken down. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely looking like there might be a comeback for St. John's. They were definitely looking scrappy on those last few fights. It just wasn't enough. They're going to have to settle with a 3-1 to one score line. But we didn't see a 3-0 shutout. So overall, I'm pretty content, Dryad. Definitely UConn meeting a little bit more of a opponents their caliber. Yeah, and uh, I it definitely looked like it was going to be closer, but it's not the first time that we see this. Sometimes are, some teams are very, very good in Hanamura, and we definitely need to highlight this. That was the case of St. John's. They were able to take the victory there, but unfortunately, it just wasn't quite enough to take the entire match. You got looking pretty good. Definitely will be taking that victory for the advantage. Absolutely, and although UConn has won, they're not quite done just yet. Now one of them has to hop into the caster's booth after a brief break. So folks, don't miss it. We're going to go to a brief break and then we'll be back with the interview.
And just like that, folks, we are back. And now it doesn't look any different, but now we're in the interview booth with Mitbin from UConn. Mitbin, welcome to the interview booth and congratulations on your win. Thank you. Now we have just a few brief questions for you. You guys looked pretty good on over St. John's for the majority of this with Hanamura being the exception. Where do you guys kind of consider your strengths to lie as a team? Is it your communications? Is it a particular role, your leadership? Where do you put it? So I think our strength really is with our DPS and our supports, really. Uh, tanks, we've had, you know, uh, some issues here and there, just getting it together and getting our comps together. But I think we've we've hit our stride and we're able to make good progress everywhere. Yeah, and you actually mentioned the timeline, and that directly connects to what I wanted to ask you. So on Hanamura, you guys were struggling a little bit more. You weren't able to take the victory on that map specifically. Um, do you think it was a matter of not being able to maybe push forward, or what do you think was going on there? Yeah, I think really just a lot of our synergy uh, didn't work. A lot of our pre-planned comps really just were not fitting well there. We had people just uncomfortable in switching into off heroes, and we just kind of all around fell apart. Yeah, and then, um, well, at least they were able to take the victory. So this connects to you. Then my second question would be, be would be um, more of, um, so when you see that sometimes things are, things are not working, maybe in Amora, maybe in other maps, um, how do you decide to change your composition? Is there something that you prepare before into, depending on what map you're playing, or depending on what's working on, what the enemy team is playing? Um, so we have uh, pre-planned comps pretty much going into every map. And then we go from there and just pretty much on the fly for any compositions we need to change. So sometimes it works out, but like on Hanamura, sometimes it uh, doesn't pan out all that well. Mm -hmm. And finally, I guess, um, uh, you know, uh, on a caster level, what are some uh, what are some matches that you'll be excited, I guess, coming up? Are there any that you're kind of, you know, looking forward to on the horizon? Not particularly. I don't know. I'm not too sure of how the other schools stack up, so I guess we'll see. All right. Well, the plus side of that is that every game looks to be a challenge, but Mitt Ben, thank you for coming in here answering a few of our questions. Before I let you go, do you want to give you the opportunity to give any shout outs? Um, I want to shout out Ali Zenyatta for um not playing Brig when we ask him to. <laughs> oh, well. And when there's supports players, what else can you do? But once again, thank you, Midben, for hopping into chat with us. And congratulations over your win on St. John's. Thank you very much. Now, with that, Dryad, we are about ready to conclude UConn versus St. John's. However, give us just a little moment, folks. We will be moving on to our next map here in about 20 or so minutes with Canisius College versus Fairfield. We'll let you know. Stick around.
Hello and welcome back everybody to EGF season two. We are on our fifth and final game of the night. Canisius College versus Fairfield University. Sir Waltham and Dryad are going to be closing it out for you tonight. Dryad, these teams, there's definitely some winners and potential losers coming through here. Yeah, last match that we're going to be seeing today, and unfortunately, one of them cannot win. One of them will be taking the defeat here, but anything can happen. Fairfield and Canisius, when we're looking at the scores that they've had so far, they're pretty even. They're not really on the top. They're not really in the bottom. They're kind of in the middle of that the table where we're able to see the score so far. So I think that's something to take into account, um, that it's still trying to settle what teams decide to play, how teams feel comfortable going against each other because none of them have really gone against each other before and this on this week. So they were important to take that into account and to see how they're able to adapt on time. And interesting, or I guess advantageous that we're seeing Canisius here because they've only played three games so far. Most of the teams throughout this league have played four. So I'm going to definitely get a better feel for, you know, how they might chalk up as we get, you know, a broader range of data and allows us to analyze things a little bit better. But so far, statistically, they sit a little bit higher than their opponents in Fairfield. Fairfield at about a one to three win loss rate. Canisius at a two to one. So, you know, the numbers there leaning a little bit more towards Canisius. But again, not so out of the park that Fairfield's just going to get walked over. Yeah, again, we haven't really seen the teams going against each other before, so we can't really speculate exactly what the scoreline is going to look at the end. But we do have um, the the scores from them before, which might be a good sign. So anything could happen. Canisius might have a little bit of an advantage, but there's been a lot of changes in Overwatch recently, and that just gives us a hint that anything, any sort of composition might give Fearful the advantage here. As has been for the rest, for I guess the rest of this evening, we're going to be starting off on Busan as our control map. These teams will be getting into the map here very momentarily. But Dryad, kind of give us a recap of what we've been seeing and therefore what we might expect to see going ahead. Okay, so we've seen a lot of that Brawl style composition coming through. We've seen a lot of damage and um, a little bit more of trying to play aggressive, getting value out of it over then playing for those rotations, playing for picks specifically. Everyone wants to kind of push forward and see how much they can get value out of it. And uh, coming into this match, coming into Busan, um, anything, uh, any sort of composition is viable here. It could work. We see a lot of Brawl and for the two teams, we were, it, it might be a hint that for Fairfield, we might see that Brawl Stop coming through. And the main time for Kanisha is going to be that dive. I do like seeing the dive a little bit more here. And that's just because you have the access to the high ground a little bit easier. And that's going to have you let you have a better positioning once you take control of the coin. So I want to see this happening from them right at the beginning. Huge possibilities coming in from Yuba. They are on that Junkrat, and we've seen Junkrats perform very well, even just as far as tonight goes. Special K, gonna get pushed up upon by WLK, and initially, already, Canisius is getting some early kills. Yuba gonna be taking down Masks with that Concussion Mine from the Junkrat, now gonna be wrapping around, and Fairfield might start feeling the chokehold here. If they're not careful, they can start easily getting swarmed. See Yuba choosing those mines, the traps as well. The Mayhem's trying to come out, not going to be finding too much Fairfield. So far, getting that point progress, being very close to getting the first cap. Tiger is dancing around that point. Both of these tanks playing very carefully around WLK, who can be such a big damage dealer to those big, meaty targets. It will eventually be Canisius College unable to hold that point for forever. Fairfield are going to take the possession of the first flip. They're going to start taking up that point progress. They will be taking a 10% already and they're looking pretty good for your fellow university. I was going to be having that coalescence coming into the next fight to try to con try to take control a little bit earlier. Canisius has to build those ultimates as well, but it's going to take them a little bit longer. The sound barrier though might keep them alive. Nice hack on the Franken Bunny prevents them from relocating as quickly, but the follow-up damage can't quite be there from Great Aspects. Wrench has the grab, but with the Winston getting taken down early from Special K, may not yield a whole lot. Yuba throws in the tire to try to shift things in Canisius's favor, and so far seems like it's gonna pay off. Franken Bunny actually getting hacked mid res, not gonna be able to bring Canisius up to full force. I mean, Fairfield has a little bit of a moment of reprieve here. Wrench might throw out this grab. It's going to have to be on a tiger to try to catch it and eat it. Wrench not going to be given the option here. Spundator manages to get out of that EMP range, but WLK under no effects of the EMP drops the death blossom. Vinicius receives the sound barrier. 
from Devil, meaning uh, they are going to be staying alive for just a little bit longer. But Fairfield not giving up any of this point progress means that Canisius not going to be able to build up that po those points towards victory. Now Canisius coming through with some of the kills. Adric bring dangerous threat to that Winston, but gets caught out by Spudnator. Now Canisius finally gets this point flip, but 75% over to Fairfield is not bad. Canisius does take the point and they're doing really, really well. They do have that death blossom in case Fairfield wants to brawl into point. They do have that tool to try to keep everyone alive, but it's not going to be easy though. In the meantime, for the side of Fairfield, like you mentioned, 75% for them. So one fight and maybe a half should be enough for them to take the victory. Oh, but they can't get picked like that. And Yuma are going to be throwing in a tire after that. A little bit risky considering they already had the advantage and the team was leaving, but the three kills with the tire, not going to be bothering them too much. They do you feel pretty comfortable after getting the 3k on jump pad? We were talking about how strong this hero is when we see you played at this level of Overwatch and definitely performing really, really well so far. But Fearfield gets another shot to try to take their point back, coalesces to initiate, then that Graviton Surge. If it doesn't get eaten by the Diva, might just be enough for them to win here. Yuba starting to feel some of the pressure gets hacked out. Not going to be able to utilize those concussion mines or the traps, but still has the left click as WLK will find out. Wrench holding on to this grab has to play it very carefully if they want to find some of the success here. Get walked up on a tiger, going to be closing the distance, putting the hurt onto this Zarya. Holding onto this grab for too long might start costing them. And the final kills also that end up coming through for the set of Kanishes. They will be passing that percentage and will be getting to around 80% before the next fight happens. Wrench has been taking this ultimate ability. Juga gets another kill now. But you know you're not going to be having that somewhere for the next few seconds. That's more pressure the Furfield has to make something happen here, especially having that EMP almost ready. WLK now choosing to go into the skies with the Farah. Although well, Yuba might be trying to answer with this rip tire of their own. Takes down a wrench that Zarya not gonna be able to use the grab once again. I mentioned it before, but this might be costly here for the side of Fairfield. As now we see Canisius getting in some of these final kills that they need. They just need to clear out the point. The Diva Bomb going online from Tiger. The Winston bubble to buy a little bit more space. Overtime burns down and Canisius takes the first point here on downtown. Everyone gets taken down, especially by that selfless shark from Tiger, right? At the end, perfect timing. And yeah, we were mentioning Ranch wasn't able to have that garbage in search. It was actually three towns where, where we saw the Saria trying to get value, trying to pull this, but getting taken down immediately. So that just means that the pressure from conditions is definitely working out for them. They know how to push the advantage, how to create more damage so that they are able to make something happen to take control of the point again. And at the beginning, it just seems like Fear Fleet was very, very dominant, but it didn't come through at the end. Certainly not. However, there is another opportunity here as we head into Mecha Base. We're going to be seeing the Winston, I mean, excuse me, the Reinhardt Zarya come out from both sides. Makes a little bit sense. Mecha Base tends to be the more brawly map. And I really, really like seeing this brawl. This means that the fight is going to happen here before anyone gets taken down. A lot of aggression coming through. A lot of opportunities to build the ultimate abilities. Anyone can take the advantage here because of this mirror tank line. We do see WLK taking advantage of soldiers' capabilities towards that high ground going up across the way. Now Airfield striking hard and fast first this time around. Forcing great aspects into that May Cryo Freeze, but the wall comes up, doesn't quite block off anybody as needed, but we'll put a little bit of pressure onto Canisius and Fairfield do get the first flip, so a lot of advantages going for them still. Definitely, they do take that 4% they will be using now. They have to leave this very, very smart. That may wall also enabling them to isolate everyone that they need to get the final kill. So it's a matter of just cleaning up, and that's going to afford Canisius to wait an extra few seconds before they're able to regroup. This is a very, very good strategy from them. Especially, Canisius is going to be having so many ultimates coming through. The grab is building up slowly, but in the meantime, having those supports to play a little bit more aggressive would be ideal. And Fairfield getting that may punished means that now Canisius might have the opportunity to lead with the strong foot. They're going to be looking to get the Earth Shatter in from Atric. This small tunnel makes everybody just a little bit more vulnerable. They're going to be really trying to put pressure onto that Rhine Shield. Special K actually receiving a Nano Boost, taking as much benefit as they can, but getting locked down it means that they can't swing as heavy as they'd like. Spudnator, however, going to drop the High Noon. Definitely put the heart down there. 
Great aspects of landing the icicles where they need them. WLK now taking a little bit of time out of their day to get onto this high ground with the TAC visor. Although, I'm not going to be opting into using that just yet. We're in fact, going to be giving up this point relatively easily. And it just takes the control of the point finally. And now they're looking so much better than we saw them before. But Fearfield does have a huge amount of ultimate abilities that Blizzard to initiate would be ideal, not really letting anyone run away. Blizzard actually doing its work to take down the tire. WLK now going to be leading in with attack visor of their own. Trying to force that Ana off the high ground, going to be succeeding in that aspect. As now WLK continues to rain from on high. Gonna have to be the Reinhardt trying to charge to shift position, taking out Adric right into the pin of a wall. However, uh, leaving the spot to allow the res to come through from the Mercy ensures that Fairfield is gonna be so far so good for this fight. Canisius College now losing the point once again. Fearfield taking control of the point again, but once again, they did use a lot into that fight now. Very risky situation for them, but they should be able to get at least to the 80% so they feel comfortable. They know that it could be one less fight territory, but they have to play this smart. And the best way to do so is going to be delaying Kanishi as much as they can. It seems like Maywall would be the strategy for this. It certainly will, but Canisius a little bit tuned into that. They're going to take a different route instead, going in through the lower ground. Not going to be able for Great Aspects to catch them up as immediately. However, the Maywall does eventually go up, although it is broken and allows the rest of the team to group together. Canisius landing a big Earth Shatter onto three. That's going to be enough for Fairfield to start losing members. Although the May trying to keep herself alive, it's only a matter of time. Fairfield now at the 99, but they don't have control. And one last fight territory for Fairfield if they know how to engage here is not going to be easy, but they do have the tools to do so. Wrench has to get that grab and search to make something happen here. As well as the shatter coming through very early on, those initiation tools are going to be the key to win here. You has the tire, but you can't use the tire if you're dead. Fairfield starting off strong once again. The Earth Shatter tries to come in, but blocked by their own Maywall. Very unfortunate, their great aspects not performing that as well as they perhaps should have. Special K actually going in for the Earth Shatter, but gets frozen right after the Shatter means they can't close on all that damage. May kind of repaying the mistake she made a little bit earlier, but Adric pays the price here now as the Reinhardt gets taken down and anti nade onto the May means that Canisius College is going to be able to lead in just a little bit, trying to time that pin with the Cryo Freeze. Not quite able to, however, as the Spud Nader trying to cut down that May bits and pieces eventually does find success in that as Canisius pushes back Fairfield once again. The Soldier definitely coming up on top in the ZPS duo, but it's getting as close as it could be. Both of the teams are going to be having over them 95%, which is one, definitely one less fight territory. Someone has to win, and definitely okay, gets taken out right at the beginning. This is not a good start for them. Yeah, but somebody from Fairfield is going to be able to get onto point. Great Aspects is going to have that Blizzard on hand as well. The Reinhardt going to be coming out. The Blizzard actually gets canceled. It's going to be Great Aspects taking the death as the Blizzard leaves their hands, meaning it's not going to go out onto the field. A costly mistake for Fairfield, not able to keep their mate alive for long enough. It's now going to be WLK dropping the attack visor on the low ground, not able to get up into the high. It's going to be the Zarya throwing in the grab, trying to get WLK away from that point. Not able to succeed, but able to lock down that soldier for long enough to take them out. Now Tiger just having to be the tank player with their Reinhardt to try to deliver the pain here as it's just the Reinhardt and the Mercy and the Sombra trying to keep their team alive and their hopes and dreams in this game. The res comes up. Adric back on the board, has the Earth Shatter, lands it onto two. The cleanup is there, takes out the Mercy, goes for a pin, doesn't find quite anything, and with that overtime, ticks down. Canisius takes Busan. Very, very close Busan, though, and that just leaves us very, very excited for the future maps that we're going to be seeing. Canisius does take the victory here, and they do so really, really well. Just those engagements, making sure that they're able to take the advantage, is exactly what gave them the fight here. But once again, now, like we always talk about, control is a map where anything can happen, and the fact that it was so even could mean that for the future map, perfect can take the advantage. Yeah, I mean, a little bit of the equalizer there when it comes to that control map. You make a great point, Fairfield. You know, they may have only shown us a bit of their true power. We might have yet to see their final form. Hopefully, we might see that develop as we move on to our next maps here. It's going to be looking like Blizzard World once again for the hybrid map moving ahead. The last two matches that we saw, it was a full hold on Blizzard World, but I don't think this is going to happen again with the level that these two teams are playing at. 
this seems like they might be able to push the payload a little bit forward here on Blister World. And that's exactly what I want to see, a little bit more aggression coming from both of them because they have really good ways of attacking, of defending. And it's just a matter of really having that coordination with your team, what's really going to make the difference. We'll see exactly how that coordination goes into play here. Worth noting, I am getting word that we will have these two teams swapping sides. So make sure you don't get fooled by that when we do go into the game here. But Triad, are there any characters or any players that seem to be standing out to you in terms of performance so far? Well, it's been very, very close, but I always like highlighting those soldiers. Always getting value, always getting those picks. It seems like it's such an essential pick on the current meta that you simply can ignore. Sometimes you can get away with playing other heroes, but every time that we saw a soldier, he was able to capitalize out of this hero every single time. So when I keep seeing him more, I think this could be a big difference into Blizzard War. Well, you need a lot of space when there's a lot of space for the attackers, for the defenders. And if you're just able to land a few headshots, that just just enough to force everyone back to play a little bit slower. And we've definitely been seeing a lot more of that soldier play and a lot more effective soldier play coming through ever since we saw the recoil changes where now it's not a direct bloom, but more so something you can compensate for rather than just a little bit of RNG. And so far, it seems like the players are liking it when you're putting down as solid a performance as some of these teams. I can't say I blame them. Definitely. And we have also highlighted a little bit of the Junkrat gameplay and how it can definitely get a lot of value on this level of Overwatch. They play really aggressive. They get a lot of damage done. And it seems like the enemy teams have a little bit more of a struggle figuring out how to counter this, how to block the damage because your shield gets taken down. Then your supports are vulnerable. They also get taken down. So a lot of pressure that they have once there's damage. And it's the same case for Farah also just having those heroes that have a lot of damage to put into the enemy team. Put, put your own team in such a risky situation that you have to make the adaptation changes to make it work. And that is why actually we're going to be seeing on the side of the defense, they're going to be holding this high ground and they're going to be also once again into the ranks. Oh, yeah, I actually wanted to see more of the dive style coming from the side of Fairfield, but this is not necessarily bad. They just need to make sure that this Ari is able to get that closure, to get the energy going, to get that gravity surge happening very, very soon, as well as having that Symmetra get close. Yeah, very crucial that they not let Canisius get up onto that high ground. The Reaper gets there either through teleportation or through just good old fashioned walking Spudnado. We'll be able to deal a lot of damage to those tanks, the teleporters being used in Fairfield. Kind of catching the rotation here coming through from Canisius and Spudnado. Getting close, but not being allowed any entry. WLK hitting them with the Helix rockets. And now looks like Fairfield putting one foot in front of the other, leaning in here. Great aspects with that sim charged up, ready to lean into some of this damage. Adric actually getting a double kill on both the supports with the charge. You don't see that too often, but keep your smile when you do. This is really, really good being able to take down this support right at the end. Now they will be going back to their positioning, making sure that no one's getting picked. No one is in a position where they shouldn't be. And they still have a lot of time for the set of finishes. They're not, not too worried. The only one fight that they have lost so far. And it's just a matter of trying to get a few picks here because the entrance for Blizzard War is not really easy. Certainly it won't be, and we're gonna hope that it's a little bit easier for Canisius as they have that Junkrat now capable of just feeding those pills through the choke. Spudnator now gonna be switching on to the McCree as well, and Yuba just trying to put that constant threat up onto the high ground, making it to where you can't really get up there, you can't stay up there as comfortably as you might like. Fairfield, you have to go in with the rotation using that sim teleporter, but it's gonna be Special K actually getting brought dangerously low as soon as they're down, the Earth Shatter comes out. Excellent synergy coming in from Fairfield. Perez will come online from Spudnator, but that just might yield a few more ult points over. And two minutes and 10 seconds remaining, still a lot of opportunities for the attack inside. And this just has to make something happen here. Fairfield definitely looking a little bit better on this defense compared to when we just saw them on the last map. But a lot of ultimate abilities, French is actually going to be having a garbage sensors, so it's a very good time for them to get value out of it. It's not going to be easy. Ideally, you want to take down the shield before to make sure that more damage, damage will be coming through. But that just might be enough for them. And Yuba gonna be seeing the fact that there is somebody trapped. Tries to rotate up, not able to capitalize with the rest of their teams. Now we're seeing the Proton Barrier come out from a great aspect. It takes a great deal of damage. Yuba takes them down. The Sound Barrier now coming out from Masks to keep the rest of their team alive. Wrench has this grab surge. Might be looking to throw it in deep. 
just to help secure this fight. Actually not going to be necessary as now the final few kills are going to be cleaned up. Fairfield so far having a really good defense. Doing really, really good, especially with the tank line that they have. And talking about tank line, one of both of them are going to be having those ultimate abilities to be used. That shatter, that gravitation surge will be coming through. And in the meantime, if they're able to use it very early on, that's how you take the advantage. If once again you're able to get a few picks, that's exactly what WLK is trying to do right now. Are looking ahead, Fairfield once again sending Yuba up onto that high flying mission. Has the tire going to be activating it in this small hallway? Fairfield, not gonna have it the easiest time to mitigate that only Zodiac Killer who falls. However, Fairfield suffering a few more losses after that. Adric, gonna be dropping the Earth Shattered Wrench. Still has the grab to try and lock down anything they can. WLK, however, dropping the Tack Pfizer, allowing that little extra punch that is exactly needed. Fairfield now gonna be looking to press on the Zarya. The late kill on the Tiger, certainly not gonna help things for Pernicious. You definitely don't want to get taken down as a Zarya because you're going to lose all the energy that they have as it last. And that's a scenario that you want to be happening, especially when you only have 10 seconds left for your team. For the side of the attackers, Kanishis has to make something happen. They do have a few ultimates, so they need to get to point first before they can worry about that. And Special K taking a big anti-nade means that they can't quite receive any of the healing on their way to point. Spudnator drops the high noon, but at a very costly dose to their health pool. Gets cut down before they can fan the hammer with the flashbang. Tiger getting cut down despite using the grab. And now Fairfield have a very good defense moving ahead. And all you need to worry about on the set of the attackers for the next round is just trying to get one tick. That means winning a single fight because of the spawn advantage that will also be benefiting you. Once you take on the defense, you're going to be having a lot of trouble coming back. Even when you have a Wrecking Ball, even when you have a Lucio, those fast heroes doesn't seem to be quite enough. So I really want to see this coming through and we are actually seeing a very even match for these two sides where Kanishas was taking the advantage from Busan and now Fairfield has a big opportunity here. Yeah, certainly do all they need to do is get that 33%, not the most lofty goal here on Blizzard World, one that we see achieved pretty much all the time, but still Kanishas might put forth a pretty stellar defense, especially considering Yuba was running the Junkrat on the attack, they might as well run it on the defense. Yeah, it definitely makes sense, but um, the, the, every time that we've seen this, it doesn't really quite work. It's a little bit of a risky play, uh, and it could definitely work out, but it just needs a lot of planning, a lot of understanding with your team. That synergy that we always talk about has to happen for your team, especially when you're on the defense. If you want to win, you can't get taken down every single bad positioning you know that the attackers are going to be benefited from. And the performance that we saw from Fairfield University just now, especially the tank lineup that we already mentioned, is what they need right now. They need to perform all as well. When she needs to get high energy and push forward, just melt everyone else, and Eric just creating space with the Reinhardt, exactly what they need. They can win it in one fight. A huge anti nade to start off the fight from Canisius, landing on the five members and are able to just hold back, get healed up, but Devil gonna be appreciating that extra ult charge. Great aspects, throwing in the teleporter, allowing for a very rapid rotation through to point. Those sim turrets are gonna be dropped right onto point, making sure that anybody from Canisius who gets too close to them starts to take that small tick damage. Spudnator trying to blast or stay out of that LOS of the one small turret. Although it looks like Fairfield already done dealing the damage. Swinging big is Adric as they push ahead. The Torbjorn, the last one to fall. That was an easy first tick. A nice little Symmetra play there coming through from Fairfield. It's going to ensure them Blizzard World. Clean fight for the side of the defenders. They definitely weren't expecting that teleporter to go there. It just happened so soon that they didn't even have a time to react. We, we said at the beginning it was only one fight that it was needed and that's exactly what happened. Now we're on a 1-1. One, one. Anyone can win here. And for this type of condition, they seem so dominant in Busan. But now Fairfield are making their comeback. Now Fairfield definitely striking back with a strong left hand punch. As now these score lines are going to be all tied up. Meaning that we still have at least two more games to go. But... I'm kind of hoping for a few draws, maybe, you know, a, t a, a two to three match moving forward here, Dryad. But before we can find any of that out, we will have to take it to a quick break. So stay tuned, folks. This is looking like a competitive one.
Hello and welcome back everyone. Not too much time to talk as we are about ready to hop straight into this next map. Hanamura going to be on the dinner plate for both these teams. Canisius College, Fairfield University, both at one a pop here, Dryad. And anyone can win here on Hanamura. When we've seen match matches either looking very close or not looking close at all, the biggest difference is always seeing how they perform here on Hanamura where Everyone seems to have a really good attack so far. No one has really struggled into the attack for first point, but the real challenge we know really comes into second point, and that might be just part of the preparation. As long as you can have one point and then try to hold the other one, that just seems to be enough. But a lot of preparation that needs to be going through, and that's exactly why for the start of the defenders, we're going to start seeing that Ryan's area once again being played. It seems like teams feel very comfortable with this composition, but also all, we're going to be having that symmetry for the teleport into the high ground. And already a great opening from Canisius as Spudnator does take down Yuba on that Junkrat, or excuse me, Fairfield getting a great opening there. Although it does get equalized a little bit with the Zodiac getting taken down. No healing available for the defense. Makes them a little bit weak, even weaker as they receive an anti nade WLK trying to maintain this high ground, but there's only so much you can do without that damage boost coming through. Already feeling some pressure from the Farah. Who does have that mercy in her pocket, Frank and Bunny, ensuring that their teammate does stay alive. The special K on this Winston trying to clear off this pesky Lucio, but as you've all seen, sometimes masks on that Lucio just staying a little too long. But it's just eventually clearing up the point and getting the flip with the brown three minutes left. Exactly what we were expecting to see from them, just a really clean fight. Now they will be pushing to the second point, and they don't have that many ultimate abilities to push forward, so they want to poke here a little bit more, try to get more damage coming through, especially from the side of Yuba on that junk card. And once that happens, once they're able to melt the shields, they should be able to push forward, try to take the victory just like that. But for the side of Fairfield, holding this high ground might be the best thing they can do right now while they try to build something for themselves. Now, Kanish is looking to take it right down the middle, right down the gut, if you prefer. Just trying to get some sort of point progress. It's going to be Special K hopping up onto the high ground. A lot of damage that can't be recovered because of a big anti coming in from Devil. It's going to be the Nano Boost on the Tiger. That Nano Boost and Roadhog could be so threatening. Spudnator from on high with the Rocket Barrage looking to drop it right down. Lands on the Mask, lands on the WLK with the cleanup on the Zodiac. But they are finally gonna be able to take a rest after performing a job well done. But is it well done enough to get some more progress up for Canisius? That remains to be seen as Fairfield has Wrench taking down a few more members. But the response is gonna be coming back rather quickly. The Valkyrie from Frank and Buddy gonna be keeping everybody alive. However, the Sleep Dart trying to come through from Zodiac doesn't quite land. Crucial there considering the whole hog coming in from Tiger. Gonna be allowing the point to be taken at a faster rate. Four minutes, 43 left for Canisius as they get that second tick. No one able to touch for the side of the deep and this fair free will try the best, but I'm actually surprised we didn't see the stall here is coming through, that Wrecking Ball, that Diva, they were still holding on to that Rhine Saria, trying to get some value out of it. And just because they're a little bit slower, they weren't able to do so 
just quiet in the meantime well we do have some highlights red has done an amazing job so far on this saria and in the meantime it just all depends into how aggressive they decide to play the tank line once again creating space it's what's enabling teams to win in this composition when we have this mirror matchup it just comes to how much space we can see those reinhardt create and on the other side how much can sorry do how much damage can be coming through while it also enabling the dps to do something else and to a fairfield's point it's a little bit tougher to run that soldier on that high ground when you know on that first point you don't really have a lot of initial angles usually you have to get them through the choke to take advantage of that roof spot which it didn't really seem like Canisius was keen to do until they already had that man advantage taking down i believe it was adric on the reinhardt before pouring in a great awareness there, or perhaps a little bit of a misplacement from Fairfield. Either way, we're going to see how Fairfield chalks up on their attack next. For Knesset, there's a lot of time remaining still in case he goes to another round, so they feel comfortable. They know they just have to have the best defense possible to try to take this victory. Four minutes, 43 seconds for them, and now the attackers for this side of Fairfield will be trying to match this time bank as much as possible, but it won't be easy. Teleporter, though, we're already having this hint that this might happen. Great aspect. It's going to be looking to teleport the entire team. And you are going to be taking a little bit of a nap, effectively bringing them out of this fight for just a moment. Although Conditious still managing to pull together some kills. Fairfield takes down the Reinhardt meeting. Not a lot of shielding can go on. It's going to be Tiger getting frozen in place, but not able to be taken down. Going to be another freeze onto the soldier. But the reload coming in from WLK ensures that, that soldier walks away, at least for the time being gonna be a little bit of the left click freeze damage and oh the mercy just standing still letting her fate come to her w kelly doing really good making a difference here into this first point where may so so important those may walls always making a difference and also to mention that symmetra coming through but this is something that for the side of finishes they can expect already they're going to going to get right into point they want to win this right now and Spudnade are going to be taking to the skies. No rocket barrage this time around. Zodiac Killer, the only one with any hit scan potential to take them out. But Spudnade is going to have to stay dangerously low if they want to do any sort of cart or point contesting, rather. Adrian receiving a nano boost, but gets throws themselves into the pit. A little bit of a tough spot to take advantage of. Yuba might have just turned this fight around with that double kill from the junk rat rip tire. Meaning that now conditions and lean into this fight even more, swinging wildly. Special K just trying to distract the opposing team as this May now gonna be staggered out for quite a bit. Everyone looking at May now, she's finally going to get taken down, but there's not a lot of time that is lost for this out of the attackers. Fairfield so still have another opportunity. They do have to wait for the May just a few seconds, but the, it seemed like the Blizzard was going to be ready. Amps are pricing the side to change the composition right away. They're committed to try to get more value now, it all depends on building the AMP as soon as possible. They already know they're in a disadvantage when it comes to analyzing the two DPS from the both sides. And that is going to be so important for the side of WOK. He has a really good performance on the soldier, but has to get the ultimate ability. I respect the commitment from Fairfield to be able to give up that May Blizzard. It remains to be seen if it's the right call for great aspects to go on to the Sombra. Earth Shatter comes in Special K. Looks to close the distance and doesn't find too much with that charge. In fact, has to put that shield up for a good while to mitigate any damage coming through until they can get the healing. Now, Fairfield looking to lean in, trying to get some point progress. Haven't achieved it as much as they might like. We're going to be seeing the bell come out from Frank and Bunny to try to bolster the defenses of Canisius so far. Tiger does have that grab online. Not going to need to commit it this time around. Is just already looking to seal up this fight. And they will be doing so, you need the entire team if possible to have the confidence that you're able to take the point. But the longer this goes, the more it's going to be benefiting Canisius when we look at the ultimate economy that they have, that barrage, Yuba also. Everything that they have is going to put so much damage, so much pressure into Fairfield to make something happen to protect themselves. And yeah, they do have that defense matrix, they also have the shield from Reinhardt, but that doesn't seem to be enough in this case. Spudnator still has that Rocket Barrage on deck, looking ready to sniff out some weaknesses here. The grab coming in, the Rocket Barrage gonna be responded to. It's gonna be three ultimates going out to grab the Nano, the Rocket Barrage, all to ensure this fight goes the way of Canisius. Adric, waking up from a nap in the most brutal way possible. But still no ticks for the side of Fairfield, and we were mentioning how important it was for the DPS of this team to try to build their ultimates very fast, 
And they're definitely taking long just because they're getting taken down right away. So that's putting a little bit more pressure. If they want to take the advantage, it has to happen now. 70% for WOK to get the tactic visor that should create enough space for them to fill and take control of the high gun very comfortably. But Sodia Killer gets taken down. An unfortunate spot can this is just able to get these initial kills and continue on with their momentum. WOK now in an advantageous spot, but doesn't have the healing that they need from the Ana. It's gonna be masks just responsible pretty much for healing this soldier. Spudnator trying to rain from on high, but we haven't really seen the soldier deal with the Farah like they need to. Largely in part due to Frank and Bunny's pocketing of that Fara, able to keep them up in the air for as long as possible. We see Spudnator trying to cut the pie there, making the soldier have to back up based off of those pure angle takes. But Spudnator taking a fire strike from the side here. It looks like a resurgence in confrontations, Ryad. And the best opportunity that Favorite has to try to take the point here is going to be that EMP. But once again, the WOK gets taken down, so no opportunity to take down Spudnator. Wrench throws in the self-destruct, takes down Tiger, a lot of members of Canisius, particularly those DPS, dangerously low, the self-destruct comes online. We're gonna be seeing Yuba hold off on that tire for the time being. Doesn't find a whole lot with it when it does come in, that just means that that Junkrat's been out of the fight for a little bit longer, the nano boost onto the Reinhardt means he's just chasing the great aspects on that Sombra away, trying to find something but can't. And is until the nano boost wears off. Now Special K has the Earth Chatter. Gotta be caught out, pinned by Adric. Able to be taken down. Adric trying to fight with all of their might, but so far have not achieved any ticks. Be pushed up upon by that Roadhog Tiger. Hacked out, can't use the take a breather. Now the EMP that comes out. WLK now with the attack visor takes down two. Now with another two falling from their teammates, this might be what Fairfield needed. It's not gonna be a nearly as good a time bank, but eventually they're gonna start getting some progress. Every time that we worry a little bit about Fairfield, WLK comes up on top with those kills out of nowhere and makes the entire difference. No one from the setup is just is able to touch point. And now they have another opportunity. We're going into the third round where anything can happen. And once again, it all tries. If I want to see something around the two teams, I will definitely be trying to hold the defense into first point. That's something that we haven't seen yet. Uh, it's going to be very tough here, given the amount of times that we saw about four times I guess the amount of time in for Canisius, uh, it, that's that's quite a lot. I mean, a minute to get, you know, any progress on first alone is a challenge in and of itself, but then to deny that same amount of distance to your opponents in four minutes, that's, that's going to be very tough. Not quite out of the reach just yet, but I think Fairfield definitely has their work cut out for them. The time bag is definitely very, very scary when you compare the two. But anything is possible for the side of defenders. They need to make sure that they're playing this very carefully. The support line needs to stay alive at any risk when they want to go with a Mercy and maybe have the opportunity for the rest. That would definitely be a possibility and an opportunity for them to hold it for a little bit longer because the spawn to get into the first point just takes so long that something has to happen in the meantime and the attackers are going to have the momentum going, try to take the advantage, jump right into point. That just might be what we're going to be seeing and two Symmetra's on the match. We do see both teams walking out with a Sim. I'm curious to see how Spudnator rolls out with this one. We don't often see the offensive Sim coming active too much, but we'll see exactly how the response comes in from Fairfield. Immediate teleport from the entire team, but a big pin from Adric onto Yuba. Enables Fairfield to not have to worry about that big of blast damage. The swings from Adric, just trying to build up that old charge, ducking and weaving out of the way of the fire strikes as needed. And now seeing it so far, Fairfield building up towards that point progress, the anti-nade onto the Reinhardt, means Adric has the opportunity to deal a little bit of damage, but they take a sleep. Wrench no longer in the D.Va mech, will try to mech themselves back up, find some success with it, but a little bit costly, and now Fairfield has to try to rush back to points. 20 seconds remaining, and those last kills that we see at the end are not going to be anything perfect if they want something going on. Kinesis is going to play this more aggressive, they know they have the advantage, they just need to hold for a little bit longer, that's exactly what they're doing. That Tiger coming in with a big slam from the Wrecking Ball allows them to knock back and fully away anybody who might be trying to make a break for the point. Adric tries to pin onto the point, but nobody's able to make it. The touch does come through eventually from Masks, but 
It's not going to be enough without the reinforcements from the rest of their team. Fairfield has to rely on masks to stall out, but there's only so much one Lucio can do. With that overtime, slowly starts burning down, but it will be faster and faster. That'd be okay, take it down courtesy of the turret from Spudnator. And with this, Canisius looking good for this first point defense. And I'm just happy that it seems like they listen to what we were saying about how you wanted them to hold that first point. That's exactly what happened. There was a lot of pressure because there wasn't as much time remaining for this out of Fairfield. So now they are in a very risky situation to hold the defense for 4 minutes 43 seconds. That's a very hard task, but it's definitely possible. It's happened before and Overwatch it can happen again. Like we were talking about, they have to play this very carefully. You might be expecting that Symmetra, so... Holding onto pawn may be ideal, just you know you have enough time that no one's going to get that one take that you need to win. And Canisius using that sim in the end to really make that teleport painful for the side of Fairfield, teleporting right into the sim turrets. It's going to cost you a little bit of life. It costs you a little bit of attention as well. And Fairfield, Fairfield they're going to commit to this tele this uh, rather the turret strategy. WLK going to be hopping in on the Bastion, it seems. Wrench on the Sigma just to bunker them down a little bit more. A very unusual strategy, but when you have that pressure of the time remaining, that is one of the best compositions that you can go for. The teleporter will be coming through and I actually like seeing this if they're going to pull it. The way that we've seen it before where everyone is able to teleport back and forth depending on the pressure that the enemy team is putting. Just like that, they should be able to win and to delay the victory at least for a little bit longer from the set of issues. The question from me is, can Great Aspects turrets or teleporter positioning provide any fire once Canisius is actually into point? We'll have to see. WLK immediately turns attention towards Spudinator and Tiger burning down that Roadhog. And thick damage coming through from Canisius, already putting the wear down onto the shields. As we can see, Spudinator just staying stationary, doesn't even need to fly up in the sky, doesn't need to make themselves that easy target just to put on the hurt for these shields. Going to be trying to come in with the jump, junk rat jump from the top. Going to be the quick teleport out. WLK leaving the rest of their team as Zodiac goes to meet them. Canisius so far not finding too much value. Not able to whittle down these shields quite fast enough to displace this Bastion. The biggest challenge that Canisius is going to have is figuring out a way around this Bastion. How are they going to take him down? He has a lot of protection, a lot of damage that is coming through from him. And you can see it every time anyone starts to peek. They almost get taken down, if not completely taken down. We see Canisius kind of working at a weak angle here. Great Aspects has those turrets set up, but the nano boots going on to Special K, looking to just knock around anybody located near that Bastion. Eventually, Special K does get taken down. Not everybody able to make it through that teleporter, but it's going to be the tank form that is online from WLK, but they take the teleporter a little bit too early. Not quite able to deliver as they need to. However, Wretch looking to pull it back out with the Gravitic Flux. Putting a lot of damage down, but the Valkyrie coming through means that a few more members might survive. The Concussion Mine actually going to be landing onto the tire of Yuba, preventing it from finding the immediate value that it needed to. Fairfield so far getting a couple of trade kills, but it might not be enough, especially as this Rocket Barrage comes through. Can't quite land onto Valkyrie, but will land onto Wrench. Your Shatter goes through, only lands onto Devil. Might not be enough as Pernicious starting to tick upwards towards that first tick as soon as they're able to clear out this Reinhardt. Adric been so resilient on this point. Great Aspects, however, is left kind of in the corner because of that special case, seeking out their target and finding them like a heat-seeking missile. Now, it's all up to kill this Reinhardt deal with the Bastion and hopefully win the game here. Asleep on the WLK as they get knocked around farther back and back. They're gonna be destroying themselves on that bubble barrier and with that, Canisius takes their second point. Canisius takes the advantage and they didn't have the best start into this match, but now they're definitely giving all they have to try to win here they're doing really really good so far and it was just a matter of figuring out what uh, figuring out a way to deal with the bastion just like that taking the victory they had a huge handbag to work with and that also enabled them to play it slow figure out change the composition they were saying that winston jump is what put a lot of pressure into the defense to the point where there was nothing else they could have done yeah, I really like the thought process that Canisius seems to have, you know, just take a little bit of damage, take as much as you need. Once the Ana has that nano boost, send the Winston in. Somebody's going to have to get this place. They probably noticed that there was no Batiste to keep the immortality field up. Overall, some excellent maneuvering there. That really allowed them to take that advantage and get that first point break. 
And now Fairfield does have that challenge again to figure out how they want to make this comeback before it's all lost. It's 2-1 at least. So once again, it's not a 3-0 that some people might be expecting into his matchups. And we were mentioning how close they were into into how close they were in this course before that they're not really on top necessarily like Rochester when we saw them before, but they're not definitely on the bottom. They're just in the middle trying to figure out how many wins they can get to try to take the advantage a little bit more. That's what Kadishas is doing right now. And my favorite way to describe these teams is mid-table, not cream of the crop, but not quite in the mud either. As now we look ahead, it's going to be our escort map. It's going to be Havana, and it being escort means there can be no ties. So that, of course, means that if Fairfield wants to stay in this, they have to come out with a win. And can they do this? It's going to be a challenge if they want to change the composition. This is a good opportunity to do so. They did make the adaptation changes right at the end to try to make something happen with the Bastion, but it just wasn't quite enough. And now in Havana, they can play other heroes. We haven't necessarily seen that much of a hitskin presence coming from them, even when we've seen it. It hasn't really been one that we can highlight too much. But if they have maybe that hidden weapon, now is time to use it. Certainly no better time than at the zero hour to pull out your secret weapon, especially when you don't want to drop below your opponents here. Now we are getting into the map to see exactly what these teams might have lined up for us, particularly on that defense. It's going to be Fairfield starting off and WLK kind of like the feel of the Bastion before. It seems like they might just keep rolling their luck on this one too. Let's see if they change his composition so far, but we can expect a lot of those Reinhardt, which is very, very surprising to see. Um, compared to other matches that we've seen where people tend to go with the Wrecking Ball, maybe with the Diva, but it definitely both of these colleges are playing to what's strongest to them, what they feel most comfortable in, and this is why, because he can is just taking a little bit of an advantage so far, but like we mentioned, anything can happen here in Havana, a lot of opportunities, and we are already starting to see Definitely the Bastion being played out. Curious to see how it's going to perform. And we see it posted up near the billboard. This does mean, however, that Canisius is going to be able to get a lot of cart progress. They have that Widowmaker locked onto Great Aspects. Great Aspects cannot be planned very carefully to ensure that they don't lose their head early on in this fight and give Canisius a definite advantage. Although it looks like Spudnate are struggling a little bit to hit these shots, instead just deciding to focus on to the shield, whittle down the Reinhardt, whittle down the Sigma as much as they can, especially while they're getting this free cart progress. Great aspects, still looking to set up this defensive zone. As this cart now begins to make its way towards that first corner, we see WLK trying to bullet the Reinhardt shield down, really put the pain onto it, wear it down, make it to where that Reinhardt Reinhardt can receive no quarter. Yuba does tear down the teleporter, meaning the WLK now located on the high ground, or at least was until Tiger throws in the hook, pulls them off. Now it's a Bastion on the ground floor. We'll see if WLK can still make this one work. It's gonna be the Roadhog pushing in towards it, but Wrench coming in with the kill right as the hook lands into the Bastion. The Earth Shatter does come out from Special K, doesn't land on a whole lot, and in fact results in Special K getting pinned themselves. Rez gonna try to come through from Zodiac as now WLK does take the knee. And WLK will try to get a little bit more rally on the soldier, but they're going to keep forcing this Bastion to work and it definitely creates a lot of space and make sure that no one from the side of is taking in a bad position or they're going to be taken down almost immediately. So very good strategy. I don't know for how long it lasts once everyone is able to push forward, especially with this person that might be enough. Wow, and Tiger timing that hook excellently, able to get mad in a split second that the Reinhardt had the shield drop. Nadra just not quite able to protect the team well enough there, but will swing big takes down the Mercy. Now Kanishas really putting one foot in front of the other. Only trying to get this first tick achieved. Took him about two minutes, but better late than never. Proton Barrier does come in from great aspects. Curious to see if they're still intent on fighting this one out. Might limit the range that Spudnator is able to perform at. And it was very, very early on, and this still to be used. It's really hard to get value out of it. WOK trying to get to point. The flux cells are coming through, but it doesn't seem like it will be quite enough. Everyone keeps getting Tenikin down. They just want to consume as much time as possible. Now, certainly a try. The sound barrier is going to come out. Fairfield now going to have to try to touch point. Zodiac Killer gets taken down by the tire. WOK managing to score some kills, but not enough as the cart has already reached that first point. Now the respawns have shifted. 
Um, but you're, that was also used very, very late into the fight. Not really able to get as much value as you would want to on this Lucio. Now, we are seeing a few changes on the side of Fairfield. They're making the adaptation changes. No more Bastion as this really hard to hold the positioning from this hero. WOK will be on their Reaper Samora Brawl Stall coming through for this teams. And also, great aspect is going to be, once again, trying to build that EMP as soon as possible with the Sombra. I like great aspects on the Sombra. Once again, might be able to mitigate a lot of the effectiveness of Tiger. Not able to take the breather. Not able to use the hook. Special K going to be popping the primal. Really trying to jostle around those supports. Being a little bit of a bully, as we've seen before. Really trying to focus down this Mercy. Does eventually find a Zodiac. And Special K not even surrendering that much health over to their opponents. As now, Canisius continues to lean forward, build up this objective progress, objective distance, if you prefer. Special K ending the kill on the masks with a melee to the face. Now, Fairfield has to recoil just a little bit. WLK stuck behind enemy lines. Yeah, but the Regentis will be coming through very, very soon. Everyone's just trying to hide, playing it a little bit slower for great aspects. Trying to build that EMP as well in the meantime. The kills have to keep coming to first half of Canisius if they want to take second. WLK does close the kill on to Yuba, so a huge amount of that burst damage is gone and out of the fight. Tiger on this high ground gets hacked out, not going to be able to take a breather, and with very little support near them, it's not likely that they'll be able to recover much health. However, it doesn't really matter. The rest of Fairfield seems to be focused on the ground fight and losing it, as a matter of fact. Budnator takes it down to his wrench, takes a little bit of a nap during the Gravitic Flux. Going to be losing that ultimate in exchange for the cart to reach the second for Knishes. A lot of ultimates that we saw and now a lot of pressure that we're going to be seeing coming through for the side of the attackers. They have that momentum going, they don't want to let it go just yet. So many ultimates and starting with that primary rage might be coming through. We also see the damage that is able to get not only with the nano that will be ready soon, but also the mercy turn to score the DPS lineup. It's forcing everyone from the side of Fearfield all the way back, even though they can't play aggressive with the EMP. And Yuba gonna be throwing in the tire early on. Takes down Adrian with no shield, no earth shatter to worry about. It's gonna be conditioned to be just lean into this fight. Special K using that primal rage once again, trying to focus on these supports. Perhaps dislocate them, prevent that healing from coming through. But Special K now gonna be caught behind enemy lines of their own. Drops the bubble to buy themselves quite a bit of protection. And will be reunited with Frank and Bunny. Going up against a Reaper might be a bold call, even more so with a Reaper against a, a Reaper with projected barrier. French making sure that their teammate stays alive and able to get back into the fight, dropping some traps and throwing some pills. Once you're able to pass a large area, this becomes much of a closer fight, but that EMP has to be used now. The EMP is going to be used in nets of five members, three of which get hit by the Earth Shatter. Death Blossom goes in to follow up. Mercy taken down, Roadhog soon to follow, and with this airfield, finally dig their heels into the dirt and start putting up a defense. Really, really good combo from the DPS lineup on the side of Fearfield. And they still have a lot of opportunities. They might seem that they use quite a lot, but no, they still have the coalition to engage early on to push everyone from the side of Canisius all the way back. And then just waiting into how much they can get value out of the picks that the DPS are also able to get. Canisius, though, if a good hook is landed for the side of Fearfield, it's going to be really hard to come back. They do see Spudnator with the high noon. Gonna be the Nano on to Special K, who does get hacked out, not able to dive in it deep. Means that that Winston's gonna have a tougher time utilizing it. Masks taken down during the sound barrier. Masks not able to achieve that. Didn't even hear the voice line go off. It's gonna be Zodiac Killer with the only support ult with any effect from Fairfield as the whole hog comes out from Tiger, just trying to secure the kill onto the Reinhardt. Spudnator throws in the high noon. Everybody trying to corral themselves on the opposite side of the cart. Spudnator does take down WLK with a fan of the hammer. Now Wrench looking to anybody for their team to give the bubble to by themselves a little bit of time and space. Winston getting the hack. Gonna be realizing that they have the primal rage and utilizing it in quick effect. Special K able to dodge out of the way of that right heart pin. Although Canisius has to get this cart delivered rather quickly. Otherwise we'll start draining time bank in a way that they might not necessarily want to. EMP goes out. Special K. Not gonna be able to leap away from this one. Great Aspects, however, getting stuck in a junk rat trap. It's gonna be the Winston taking a little bit of a sleep right in front of the feet of Sombra. So Vicious, perhaps capitalizing on the hubris of Adric that Reinhardt going a bit too deep. And with this, this fight's not quite over. Fairfield gonna let themselves try to recollect. WLK has this Death Blossom in pocket. 
really, really long fight. This could be a one less person here. You tell you that that blossom does pick into the mercy, so one less opportunity not having those skills is going to be crucial for them. Certainly will, but we do see the nano boost going on to Special K that Winston gonna be able to provide a little bit more damage, but the Diva Peel, excellent coming in for WLK. Not gonna be hit by that last bullet of the fan. The hammer might just have saved that Reaper and helped this team win the battle. You see the hack on the special K means the primal rage to buy more times. Not gonna quite be there if the kills come through quick enough. It will not, however, as the primal rage does get activated. Sound barrier for masks gonna cover each and every person on the field for their team. Meaning Fairfield has an opportunity to not let this third point go. High noon from Spudnator needs to be careful, does find WLK. Meaning that now two members from Fairfield gonna be less effective in this fight. WLK and Wrench, who are de both dead and D-Mech respectively. As we see, Canisius has Yuba back in the fight with this tire. One drop from the high ground might spell destruction for the side of Fairfield. It takes down Zodiac Killer. Not much left in terms of stall potential here for Fairfield. They need to start getting some kills, but they can only do so much. No ultimates on the board either. Great aspects. The closest with that EMP 10% away. Adric not going to be able to walk back and use that whole hog in time. Looks like it's going to be up to the Diva to try to use the self-destruct wrench, dropping it right on the enemy team, getting the re-mech to buy themselves as much time as possible, Dryad. This is looking a little bit crazy. There's so much action going on still for the side of the defense. Like we don't want to get it up just yet, but it seems like it's just a matter of time before the cleanup comes for the side of Canisius. They will be taking down everyone, and it's just a matter of time. The payload will be getting into that third part of the map, and just like that, it goes to overtime, but they are able to do so. Oh, that was so ridiculous. Fairfield, on that last fight, looked like they were getting just enough kills to put things in their favor. What happened? What turned around, Dryad, that Canisius was able to take that last point? For this out of fear, really, it seems like they were over committing some of the ultimates right at the end, and that just put a little bit more of pressure that they didn't want to have. It was looking pretty good for the defense, though, but once they kept getting picked over and over again, it just put a lot of the disadvantage that you don't want to have in that case. Still big opportunities, though, for Fail Food to try to make something happen here. It definitely won't be easy, though, so I'm very curious to see what they have to bring if you're going to be seeing another composition at the beginning we actually saw bastion again so if you wanted to bring a really weird hero that we haven't seen before this is a big opportunity to do so certainly is we'll see how exactly this pans out as these teams are looking to get set up and come out from these spawns about 30 seconds as we might have heard for these teams to get ready get set up and now it's going to be fairfield going on the attack They'll be going into the attack, and we're not quite sure what we're going to be seeing just yet, but it seems like that Roadhog Saria might be coming up very early on. And we already talked about the importance of that Roadhog playing as a main tank, creating space necessary, especially into this part of the map where there is a lot of space available, and you need to make sure you're getting picks to try to push forward. We see a WLK on this. Hanzo going to be trying to land some long range headshots as well as wear down the shield of Special K. Tiger brought dangerously low. Has to be a little bit careful back off and relieve a little bit of the pressure that Fairfield might be feeling at this point. Yuba trying to throw in some long range pills, but it's going to be less long range than WLK on that Hanzo. Great Aspects has to be careful. Does get the hack on the Tiger. Gets out with relative safety. Spudnator on the soldier, taking a little bit of a sharp angle against the rest of the team. Wrench able to close the kill onto Yuba. A huge opportunity though that gets spoiled by Special K as they swing big, hit two, and take two down. The rest trying to come through, does succeed. Zodiac Killer almost got eliminated by Spudnator. Not quite the case this time around though. Spudnator continues to push forward, drops that beacon just to keep themselves in the game for a little bit longer. And now it looks like Kanish is going to be trying to push up towards the spawn of their opponents they will be doing so and they feel the confidence that they're able to get value out of it now that soldier we were mentioning the value that the series is able to get that's exactly what's going to happen the fact that vibes are creating a lot of space would be ideal for this team what they're able to build a shatter that's almost ready you see the shatter online nothing to block and save maybe the zarya bubbles wrench has to be on a queue if they want to land it the tactical visor from on high is going to be activated spudnator Throwing it in doesn't find too much there, but Canisius will be good with the cleanup either way. But they're now trying to back up, throws down the healing beacon once again. A wrench caught in the fight just a little bit too long. Two minutes, 20 seconds remaining for Fairfield, and that EMP is going to be ready soon. If they have an opportunity, it will definitely be that one. We do see the tire come out, WLK taken down. No opportunity to combo the dragons with the grab this time around, which 
may very well be the big win condition for Fairfield. They want any opportunity of getting through this first point. It's looking really, really good for the side of a decent team. I mean, Tanisha is definitely doing their job, but now Friendship does get punished again. Fairfield is having a lot of trouble coming through on this place, and they once again are using the ultimate economy to the point where it's not really benefiting them. Yeah, it feels like Fairfield just having a rough time getting grouped in general. WLK now getting taken down early on. We have not seen a solid regroup coming in from Fairfield, and Vinish is taking absolute advantage of this as we see Special K inching towards the spawn, eventually going to back up knowing that they don't want to get too into this. Every time it seems like they are going to use EMP, also they keep getting taken down. So for Fearfield, great aspects has to do this very early on, making sure that if he gets at least a few hacks, ideally getting the tanks would be the best situation for the team to push forward with it. They do see the grab go out, the dragons to follow up, not able to keep alive. Special K is Canisius, meaning that Fairfield now has a solid route towards that first point. Soldier up on high with the Ana, only able to do so much damage, so much healing before having to back off because of the Zarya, because of the Hanzo. Great Aspects trying to cause a little bit of a distraction themselves, and it will be Spudnator who can come out of this tunnel, but WLK popping up, saying hello to the Ana with an arrow to the head, but Spudnator avenging their fallen comrade. As it looks, this healing beacon gonna come out, keep them alive for a brief moment. Yeah, and then also the tire comes through, not really any value out of it just yet, but do you, do you see them taking out one by one? He does get the Reinhardt at the end, and just like that, Canisius does have the momentum going for them again. They're able to hold for a little bit longer, and it's only 25 seconds remaining. Fairfield, now is the time to use that EMP that we've been talking about. That qualitative will be also ready for this kind of mask, and it has to happen for the early engagement. Well, on the early engagement, WLK takes down Spudinator. We have 10 seconds left. Somebody's going to have to touch for the side of Fairfield if they want to stay in this. The EMP comes in, lands on to four. Devil, however, still has that nano. Should they opt to use it, they will. And it's going to be on to the Reinhardt. Has to keep his shield up just to protect the rest of their team. However, the Valkyrie coming in from Zodiac means that it's going to be Fairfield who has that healing advantage, especially with the Coalescence as well in pocket. Gonna be WLK going for a little bit of a flyby, not really bothering to call attention to themselves with Spudnator. Able to take the shot to the side of the head, and because of that, Cart delivered to first point. Overtime still got there. It seemed like they weren't able to use it. Canisius had a very good initiation, but it didn't really quite deliver the way that they wanted to. They don't have as much time left for the side of the attackers as they would want to, but still more than enough to win out just a few fights. The ultimate economy is what's going to make the difference here. They did use a lot before, so they need to make sure they recover because Canisius does have everything. WLK dropping early might be expensive here in terms of time bank. Canisius now might look to press their advantage here. We see Tiger grouping up with the Reinhardt. Yuba dropping the tire just to ensure that this fight continues to get pushed back and back. Perhaps knowing that Fairfield's not going to back up here. We do see that Reinhardt. Adric on the cart trying to swing big, hold their position, but the cart's not going to move that far back to just get a regroup in. A lot of da damage coming from Yuba, definitely making the difference. Wrench is able to take him down, but once again, you need the rest of the team to try to get a little bit more value now. He might just get punished for this, trying to run away just for a little bit longer, and Fearfield is able to build a field ultimate, so it's not looking too bad. That Selfie Strong might be big if they're able to put it in a good position. Tiger also going to have to be very careful that Wrench does not eat that Graviton Surge. Huge potential there, but Wrench now out of sight of Tiger. As Tiger begins backing up with their other tank players. We're gonna be seeing WLK with the Dragons online, but no grabs to combo with this time. It might put them in a very unfortunate spot if they can't lock down the opposing team. However, Spudnator taken out of the fight, as is the tactical visor. The Diva Bomb coming out from on top, not able to buy a whole lot of space, but the Earth Shatter coming in from Canisius lands onto Adric. The Reinhardt goes down, tries to drop the Earth Shatter of their own, but gets caught mid-swing. Special K able to take them down, meaning that now Canisius has this ultimate advantage. They're going to be leaning in with the Coalescence once again, trying to find the benefit here. Almost taking the pin is Frank and Bunny, but they're able to fade out of it, avoid it, and Adric now caught in no man's land. Able to be able to, going to be able to back out, though. 25 seconds remaining, the last opportunity for Fairfield if they want to win this, if they want to get the second point, this is a good start. The great aspects does take down Tiger, no energy coming from them. And the Coalescence also pushing from the beginning of this one, they want to win here. And it's just Yuba throwing in the tire with that special K taking out two members of their own after the nano boost hits them. Now has the Earth Shatter, that means that somebody's gonna have to touch Cart and somebody's gonna have to put them at risk of hitting the floor. 
has Spudinator on high with that attack visor already. No diva means that attack visor is pretty much gonna be free. Aside from any LOS that gets broken here, Lucio has to touch, but that means he has to cross the attack visor. WLK gonna put an end to that, but can only do so much. The one Hanzo not gonna be able to touch as much as they would like. Overtime is gonna burn down. This is where Canisius is gonna win. They do take the victory 3-1 for this team. And it was very close, but here coming on Havana, it just became a little bit more challenging for this out of Fairfield. They really they didn't really know how to engage, and that made the entire difference on the side of the defense. So now that's why we see Canisius looking pretty good. I did like seeing the changes that they made throughout the entire match. They were working together more than we saw Fairfield doing so. And on this certain compositions where you're playing bro where you're playing the Ryan Saria you definitely need that coordination with your team to make sure you can win yeah so far well I guess overall Kanishas looking fairly strong particularly on that Havana map I don't think that uh, Fairfield was quite able to deliver the performance that we'd seen from them on past maps and unfortunately that would end up being the nail in the coffin here but for asking my opinion, I think they came out well despite their stats. Fairfield suffering a pretty big loss deficit prior to this match with Canisius having a you know win over, well, I guess, a win positive record. Uh, I, you would expect that to typically go 3-0, but the fact that Fairfield was able to put any maps on the board speaks well for him. Yeah, the more wins you can get, the more comfortable you're going to feel going against the future matches. Once you start losing over and over again, you might not feel as confident as you would want to on here on ETF. So that's what I want to see. But I do want to see the comeback for all these teams that have lost today. They still have a big opportunity getting, going against other teams. It just seems like the matchups were a little bit uneven for them, a little bit unfair. But they still have the time to make the adaptation changes to figure out what meta works best and how they can win next time. Yeah, better be hitting those books if you want to see that skill improvement coming through. But with that, that was the end of our fifth game. However, one last interview going to be coming your way here after this brief break. So stick around, folks. We'll be right back.
Hello and welcome back, folks, to our final interview of the day, but certainly not least. Canisius College has graciously sent us Frank and Bunny to answer a few questions. So, Frank and Bunny, first of all, congratulations on your win over Fairfield. Thank you. Now, I want to ask, going into this match, was this kind of business as usual for you, or did you kind of look over Fairfield and consider how they compared to you? Um, we definitely did watch a lot of VODs on Fairfield just to kind of see what they're bringing. Um, we saw them running the meta last week, so we were a little worried about that. But, um, you know, I think it was more business as usual. Um, we knew their ranks were very similar to ours, so we were expecting a very close um, game. And, yeah, I think that's what we got. Yeah, that's definitely what we were talking about at the beginning as well, how it seems like it was going to be a very even match, but yes, actually ended up coming up on top 3-1. So yeah, once again, congratulations on that. And I do have a question, um, which is, so you mentioned a little bit of that VOD review that you were doing uh, for this team, but how how well do you prepare? How much cream time do you put into for your team to try to take the victory into these matches? Um, we try to do two practices a week. Um, one's kind of focusing on map specific comps and then the other one is more looking at the team we're facing themselves and what we think they're going to bring, what we think they're going to bring for each map, um, how they've been playing. So would you consider that your team adapts more to that? the composition that the other team is playing, or do you play more to your strengths? Because you have a lot of, you mentioned that you have a lot of preparation and you review what they're going to play, what they've been playing. Um, you saw that Fairfield was playing the meta and you were trying to figure out what to do around that. So do you just kind of play to counter? I'd say we definitely try to start out playing our comfort picks, um, what we base around the maps themselves and the comps we want to play. Um, but we do keep in the back of our minds what we're going to switch to, um, knowing that they're, they might bring out this, they might bring out that. Now, finally, Frank and Money, do want to thank you very much for coming in here, answering a few questions. I know it's perhaps a little bit later. I know it's late for myself and Dryad, but before we let you go, I do want to give you the opportunity to give any shout outs you think are necessary to your team, your friends, your family, whoever. Um, I want to shout out our honor player, Devil. Uh, he came up with this amazing nade um, at Hanamura for our attack right before the match, like yeah. not even an hour before. And he was so excited to do it. And I'm so glad it worked out. Well, a fantastic. There you go. Devil getting the shout outs from Frank and Bunny. Frank and Bunny, once again, thank you for tuning in, hanging out with us in the interview booth. And congratulations on your win over Fairfield. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And with that, Dryad, I do believe we are about ready to wrap things up here after a long day of casting, a long day of Overwatch in general. Can't be more than pleased with the way things ended, Canisius versus Fairfield. So for those of us here at EGF, thank you for tuning in for Season 2. Be sure to join us next week for some more Overwatch action. For Dryad, I've been Sir Waltham, joined by Dryad. You can catch us at Sir Waltham and at Dan Dryad. Until next time, folks, stay safe out there, everybody.